Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Heather Ruddock. Um, I am Strategic Engagement Manager at Walters Kluwer Corporate Reporting Solutions. And I'd like to welcome you to the second Sydney ATO Tax Risk Management Workshop this morning, which is also being live webcast around Australia with 170 people on that webcast. Some of you may wonder who is Walters Kluwer. Walters Kluwer is the parent company of CCH. And since January this year, we have rebranded some 89 brands around the world to the Walters Kluwer brand, including our brand, although we get to keep CCH Networks, CCH Integrator, and of course the much loved CCH Master Tax Guide as our brands. More than four years ago, we started a journey with CCH Networks and what is now the Minter Ellison Tax Controversy Practice to look at managing ATO audits and litigation risk. And that journey morphed last year into two workshops in Sydney and Melbourne, dealing with how to build a good tax risk framework. We, we, what we saw from that, um, those two workshops last year um, was a, something of a disconnect between the ATO view of what is good tax governance and what is good tax risk management and the tax manager's view. And so we determined to put together a conversation between the ATO and the tax managers themselves and this is what these ATO tax risk management workshops are about. We're delighted to have the facilitation of Minta Ellison to help us put this together it is an interactive session. We encourage you to comment and ask questions and those on the webcast, please feel free to email your questions. I'd like to introduce the panel. We have leading the ATO team um, this morning, Steve Howland, ably supported by Sandra Farhat and Michael Dragaris. On our tax panel, as they are sitting, Kate Foster from IMED Network, Darren Day, from Woolworths, Dale Gordon and Chris Plakias, both from Westpac, and facilitating from Minter Ellison, Chris Kinsella, Karen Payne and Stephen Jones. There are surveys in the packs and they are being emailed online to the web um, cast attendees. We would be delighted if you could give us feedback on this program as it is something of a new initiative for us. And for those who have mobiles and are in the room, could I ask you please to either turn them off or switch them to mute, please. Now over to Chris. Uh, well, good morning, um, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I, I was just thinking 20 years ago, I did a two day media training course, and at the end of that media training course, the presenter told me that uh, he said, Chris, you have a face for radio. Uh, I've never forgotten that and now I have 170 people watching me on video camera today so I'm hoping the, uh, they will observe we've got a panel here so that, that's good so I'm hoping most of the attention will be on them. Um, you will hear this morning um, in terms of the agenda just as, um, uh, as Heather pointed out you'll firstly be hearing from um, uh, Steve Howland who again blames me for getting him into tax 20 years ago. Uh, he can explain that. But um, when Steve presents, he encourages questions from the floor. Um, I have here, I should point out, an iPad screen. So the 170 people who are there on the video camera can send their questions through. Um, I should point out to the people on the video camera that they're going to be filtered before they get to me. So if, you, if your question gets asked, it means it was a good question from the people up the back who are filtering them. Um, we have the corporate panel here, and you will see uh, that I and Karen and Stephen will be deflecting a lot of the hard questions across to the corporate panel. So I put them on notice um, that the hard questions are coming to the four of them. So without further ado, I'll ask um, Stephen to go up to the lectern. Um, oh, excuse me. <coughs> So, um, yeah, Steve Hannon from the tax office. Um, the story about uh, Chris is that 19 years ago in Sydney, I'd, I'd just come to Australia from England and I was doing a horrible job as a forensic accountant uh, and I saw an advert with Coopers and Librand were looking for auditors in Singapore. 
uh, and I went to see Chris because he was a partner working in Singapore at the time. Uh, and I didn't become an auditor because I really wasn't qualified. I was just chancing my arm. Um, but uh, Chris put me onto a guy in Singapore who actually ran the GST business, and that my background was in VAT. So if you think about, you know, how do you end up in a certain place? There's key points in your life, and Chris was one of the key points in my life. I'm um, oh, sorry, that sounds very romantic, doesn't it? <laughs> um, <Yeah>. I don't. <laughs> Uh, Could you want to swap some of the That's right. Yeah. So, um, YouTube, here we come. That's right. so, it, it, uh, I've embarrassed myself now. So, uh, anyway, um, what we're going to do this morning is, is look at um, risk management. Um, and it is titled as a workshop. So, that means interactive in my, in my world. Uh, we've got a, an esteemed panel here. Uh, I'm sure that when I say something, they might go, uh, I've got a comment there, so let me know. Or if you've got a comment or a question as I go through. So we won't, we won't do questions at the end. We want to do that as, as we go through. So make it more of a conversation um, if we can. So, um, so we're going to cover, though, for the first hour of what we call the plenary session. We've just started on time. We've got about an hour. And I'll talk about risk management in general. Uh, and then uh, my colleagues will talk about international consolidations and I'll come back and talk about GST because my world is GST okay so uh, any tricky income tax questions I'll be like shifting over to, to, to these guys here so um, so please and we've got people on the, on the webinar as well so I see that we've got the technology to gather tweets it's a bit like Q&A isn't it I feel like Tony Jones um, okay so if you think about, as we go through this as well, picture your business as we go through. You know, what does your business uh, look like in terms of risk? Um, where does your business sit on the risk continuum? So reflect upon that as we go through. Um, what advice can you contribute to the discussion this morning? Okay, like I say, very welcome. And what questions uh, could you ask that we might be able to provide some solutions? But at the end of the day, you know, you come along to one of these events and it's what you do when you get back to the office that's important as well. So keep in mind that make some mental notes for stuff to do when you get back to the office. So to begin, brilliant, it works. Okay, so just going to talk about the ATO for a few moments. Um, I don't know whether you know, but the ATO is reinventing itself. Um, and it's really serious about it as well. We had a commission, change of commissioner about two years ago. Uh, the commissioner came from outside of the ATO, first time in 100 years. Uh, and you can imagine that that was actually quite a cultural shift, uh, just getting a, a commissioner from outside of the ATO. We had traditionally uh, bred our own commissioners. Um, and if you, if you like, perhaps our culture had, uh, had, um, had developed over 100 years. There's certain ways that an organisation acts and works. And risk is um, most probably one of the features that, uh, the, uh, um, that our organisation needed to address. Um, I think you'd most probably say is that an institution like the tax office, you know, long-standing institution, monopoly position, and reputation is really important of the institution and also the law. Um, so, you know, we have a, we, we had become uh, what I would describe as, as risk averse, okay, and this might, so our, in dealing with risk, we needed to actually free ourselves up from, from being risk adverse. I saw a cartoon the other day and it was some risk managers sitting around a table and the caption underneath read, we have considered all risks except the risk of avoiding all risks. Uh, and that's a risk in itself, you know, being uh, risk avoiders. Uh, I think that's the space where, where we had got to. So we talk in terms of moving away from our former culture of risk aversion to actual appropriate risk management. And really appropriate risk management is what we'll be talking about today. Okay, so we're talking about what does that mean? But you know, the tax office does have a, a, have a, a particular problem because of its institutional position. Um, there's values and principles that we have to ad adhere to. Equity and fairness is, uh, is, is, is uh, some of the key uh, principles that we apply. So, you know, you, if you have equity and fairness as one of your cornerstones of how you operate, um, you know, you, you end up with one rule for all, 
Okay, you'll you'll hear that within the tax office, and you can you know as as taxpayers you'd expect that you know the same rule should apply to everyone, but what we ended up with as well because we're risk averse is one rule, because a few did the wrong thing, okay, and then you, we get stories back from taxpayers saying, oh look you're being a bit harsh here, but we said yeah but it went wrong once you know, so but now we're asked to challenge ourselves and say well what really is the risk? What is the quantum of the risk? What's the chance of it occurring? We need to. Our organisation needs to recognise individual circumstances uh, a bit more than we have. So it's not one rule for every situation. So you see just recently the Assistant Treasurer has just announced uh, some freeing up of the Commissioner's discretion. Commissioner's discretion to not apply the law. Okay, that's, that's a major change. Uh, and I'm telling you what's been announced, okay? I'm not telling you any secrets. So the Commissioner is going to have statutory remedial powers uh, and uh, be able to create disallowable legislative instruments. What it basically means is that if the law doesn't quite operate properly uh, because of the way it was written, maybe it was written for the few but didn't apply to the many, then the Commissioner can actually come along and say, well, actually that law will not apply in these circumstances. And this puts a, uh, the announcement is it puts some, uh, if you like, some boundaries around that. Uh, so it depends on the quantum. Uh, uh, and also as well is that it must be for the benefit of taxpayers. So the Commissioner can't step outside the law to the disbenefit, according to the announcement. But that means a flexible approach to risk management, more of a flexible approach to risk management. Um, and the last thing I'll say about reinventing, um, uh, the ATO, us going, uh, our, our office is going through a cultural change. It is a bit about systems, it is a bit about interfacing with taxpayers, but the most important thing is about mindset with the, within the tax office and its approach to engagement with taxpayers. And I've seen the shifts as well. I've asked people, I said, have you seen the shift? And they say, well, yeah, amongst your senior managers, but a bit further down, maybe not so much. But I've seen the shift um, occurring. Um, so, like I said, we're looking for appropriate risk management in your, our circumstance, but also in your circumstance. We're also, as well, future-focused with the notion that prevention is better than a cure. Um, <clears throat> so, um, we accept though, uh, when we look at you, uh, when we look at large corporates and medium-sized corporates and small, small corporates, we accept that most people actually just want to get the tax uh, right. Um, and so really it's about how do you actually achieve that. If you've got the will, what is the way? <clears throat> um, I'll just stop there because it's supposed to be a bit interactive and i just re reflect back on um, reinvention of the ATO. Um, it would be useful to, f for my organisation to understand what your perception of what the ATO is going through. Is, is, do, do any of you perceive a change in the way the ATO... See, I would, like, last year I'd been growling at you by now. Right, so, Steve, you know. let, let's put our corporate panel to work, our, our four representatives over here, and just ask in their organisations, conscious we have two from Westpac um, here today, um, have, have they seen, so the new, new commissioner was appointed, just refresh my room, 1 January 2014 or 13, I'm losing. I'm losing 14, it as well. Uh, 13, was it? How time flies. So two and a half years with the new commissioner. We've heard uh, just now from Stephen around uh, a flexible approach, a more pragmatic approach to risk management. Has that manifested itself uh, for the corporate panel um, in their day-to-day -day interactions? And each of you, certainly uh, Westpac and Woolworths, would be having regular interactions with, with the ATO. Any, yeah. any comments on that? Um, our experience is that um, they're a lot more commercial and they're a lot more pragmatic in relation to resolving issues. Um, you know, the other thing, Steve, you mentioned is the Commissioner's discretion, which is, I think, a great thing because um, in the banking space there's been quite a few issues where the law just doesn't work and the, the, historically the response has been, well, the law doesn't work so you need to take it off to Treasury to get the law changed. Whereas now with the Commissioner's discretion, I mean, Treasury's um, fairly scarce resource at the moment and it's, you know it's only the big issues that are getting through there so this is this is great from a commercial perspective and also from a timely perspective mm. 
Yeah. Yeah, um, I'd make the comment that I, I think there's still, I, I think there's been a change, but there's still a period of adjustment. So the ATO, in my view, is a great deal more commercial, but sometimes still wants to see a lot of detail about things that are actually quite small. Yeah. Um, and you look, you stand back and you say, well, that, that's pretty tiny in the scheme of things. Um, wh wh why the detail? Yeah. Um, there's nothing really in this. Now I appreciate that the ATO sometimes needs to know some facts before they can make that assessment, but sometimes even just a dollar value should be the flag to say, well, geez, there's not much in this, so let's try and look at stuff that, that's bigger and spend our time on that. Yeah. So that would be the one observation I would make. Yeah. Any thoughts from, from, from the audience at all? Do you not see the ATO that often enough to notice the change? Maybe that's the case. Well, that's a good thing. You don't want to be seeing the ATO too often. So uh, that's most probably a bad sign if you see us too often, unless you're really big and we like you. Um, so uh, um, I was just, um, I was just uh, reflecting on the, you know, the dollar value issue. It, it, is, it is a live issue for us. You know, we, we do have processes to try and concentrate on consequence, you know, which is dollar value and likelihood. So our risk profiling and all that sort of stuff is based around there. But I, 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 I know of situations where we've sort of argued to the nth and you say, was it really worth it? Um, so, uh, Steve, I can provide it something in the opposite direction. Yeah. Um, I agree with the comments made, but sometimes, uh, and what I've seen in my experience is that working with some large corporates, my former life was in banking, so I understand where Dale's coming from. Sometimes it's not just a dollar value, it could be the actual tax risk itself, the actual piece of legislation. Yep. And sometimes we look at it because we're trying to find out what the effect is and whether the law needs to be changed. So we need to understand where there may be problems. So it may not be coming from the perspective of there's a mischief that you have created or you or your client has created. It's just understanding to get a, that larger picture of whether the law is operating as intended. So perhaps it's the way we communicate as well to get that message across. Okay, thanks, Michael. Um, so, so moving along, here's the diagram. Um, these are the major components. I must probably re repeat these I I I I in a little while, but um, just reading through there, you'll see that a robust tax risk management has to have systems that are maintained and upgraded, adequate staff training and capability, uh, clear policies, process and documentation. Uh, you must have an investment in terms of resources into the tax and accounting function, uh, plus a policy of process and review. Now, if you, if you do all those well, you most probably have got a robust uh, tax risk management. That's not to say things won't go wrong. Things will still go wrong. Um, but uh, you're minimising your uh, chances. So if, if there was a catch phrase, it would be something like invest in risk management to prevent, your, to prevent having a risky business. Um, so we could tell stories, though, about where this system has broken down. And when I, when I talk, come back a little bit later on and talk about GST, I'll give you some examples. Uh, they tend to be about the human things, you know, about people not being trained. Um, so you put in this whiz-bang system uh, and yet you don't train the people to use it properly or the staff changes. Um, and so, you know, best laid plans of mice and men and then it comes down to operation. Uh, as being really one of the critical areas of risk. So if you think about now, think about do you have all of those um, elements in your risk management uh, framework? Um, and if you don't, then you need to be thinking about um, what you're going to do. Um, <clears throat> so you need to ensure that you've got the appropriate systems, governance and controls. Uh, they're in place and they're appropriate for your business. But how do you decide what's appropriate for your business? Um, I'd, I'd give you a, a story about um, what's appropriate. Um, oh no, sorry, I, I misled myself with my notes. You need regular reviews and testing uh, and also as well to make sure that the systems are operating effectively. And you, you need to seek appropriate advice on contentious or uncertain issues. Now, that's, that's always a bit difficult, actually, is where do you draw the line? Um, our preference has traditionally been if you're concerned or if it's uncertain, then come to, to the tax office for, for advice. 
Um, I think that sounds, you know, from your pers perspective about certainty, it does put uh, a burden on the tax office, though, because we end up getting asked lots of questions, which we respond to. But also, as well, it gives us a sense, though, of certainty as well, uh, and assurance that, uh, you know, you're at least uh, coming to us when, you, when you're in, in doubt. I don't know what the panel feel about, um, you know, that risk management. I know some businesses say, well, don't ever go to the tax office because you might get the wrong answer. Uh, and... Uh, or, or and some, uh, some. I actually, I, I had to ring up one taxpayer once um, because they were sending in requests daily, um, and um, I was just rang them up and just sort of said, do you, "Do you really need to do this?" You know, and that was their job, right? It seemed to me it was asked rulings from the tax office. It seemed to be all they ever did, um, and they were very conservative, uh, but really, really conservative. Um, but what's the panel experience? Stephen, I just have one question that comes through here and it comes to the panel. But if you asked, I'm confident, um, if we asked Westpac or Woolworths or IMED, do they have a good tax management framework in yep. place, they will say yes, yes and yes. Yep. But they won't see each other's um, tax management frameworks. Yep. Um, the commissioner will when the commissioner goes out and talks to each of them. So the commissioner knows best what is best practice with good tax risk management framework. So um, I suppose it's throwing a question back yeah. to the ATO panel. Yeah. How do you share? How do you, for example, Westpac won't know if its tax risk management framework is better than CBA, NABs, and ANZs. It just yeah. it thinks it will will be, but how does it? How do you share back to the panel what good tax risk management is? Okay. Yeah. Um, Steve, well, Steve, I'll jump in while you think yeah, about that. Yeah. Every business is going to be is different. That's right. So your risk management framework has got to be tailored to your business <laughs> and your risks. So if you just cookie cut, you know, did a cookie cutting exercise of taking someone's you know, Google or tax risk management framework and just put it on your business, you'll be able to wave it around but it may not actually be good enough for your business. So there are businesses that need greater training. There are others that are a bit light on on systems, so they need systems help or they need a more focus on manual intervention uh, and checking that. So um, they, it's probably a good thing that all our systems are different. The challenge for taxpayers is to communicate why their risk framework works for them and to communicate that, build a relationship with the tax office. I don't know if I can add to that, Chris, too. It's a... It's a very important point about appropriate for your business. Um, another dimension is um, the way I've operated when looking at governance frameworks and not necessarily assessing them but just looking at them to see where we can lower compliance costs in terms of information gathering. Now whether that's in real time or through our regular our legacy products. I tend to split up anyone's business into their flow business and non-flow business. So if you have a, the flow of business is what you do day by day. Now, Inherently, that shouldn't change very much over time, and if it does, we'd like to know. But once we've had a look at that, we tend to say, we've understood the tax risk, you've understood your own tax risk, you've got things in place, so we shouldn't bother you with that again. Hence, that helps the commercial aspects. What I suppose would attract our attention is the non-flow side, where the anomalous things arise. When I say anomalous, not in a mischievous way, but things that don't ordinarily arise, a restructure. You know, a disposal, things like that where they don't happen day to day, which would affect materially your tax outcomes. And then we would like to see what you would do in that process around your governance. How do you record things? What contemporaneous, contemporaneous documentation do you have in place? What procedure do you have in place? Do you need or have a policy in place to get opinions if need be? Do you come talk to us? You know, and at the very end, what controls do you have in place you know, to assure yourselves that what you've actually said should be done is being done? Because at the end of the day, when we come talk to you, and we'd like to do this, as Steve said, in the pre-lodgement space as much as possible so we can then highlight any concerns we have well before you need to lodge, so there's no surprises for anyone on lodgement, we can then have that full understanding discussion up front. And so there's mutual transparency. And, and what, what leads from that is certainty as well. And that, on just on that point on certainty, certainty doesn't just mean a private ruling because we understand there are inherent costs associated with private rulings. But as Steve said, there's a balance between how many resources we have and actually working for yourselves. So we want to get that balance right. So you can come to us and depending on the level of certainty you require, we can provide you that level of certainty. Whether that's, we think that it's a low risk, so we'll tell you it's a low risk. I don't say it's no risk, 
But from a compliance perspective, it's low risk if you execute this transaction this particular way and lodge your return that particular way. That may be all you need. You know? But if you need a higher level of certainty, then you can go to that form, those formal things like a private ruling. Michael, can I just comment on that? Because I yep. think the, uh, the private ruling system is well established. And, yep. You know, everyone knows how that works. Yep. And um, certainly from my experience, it works well. Um, if you go below that and say, well, I don't want a private ruling, I just want something else. Sure. Um, is the tax office still coming to grips with what, oh, absolutely. what that looks like? And, absolutely. And how do you, how do I'm you familiar with that? it. I'm familiar with it because effectively I started real time work back in 2010. So I've understood how what is necessary in the commercial space. And I've worked outside at some tax office, so I know the pressures that are on in terms of timing. So and I understand that nothing's ever certain, things keep changing. So what you need is a point in time level of certainty. So a private ruling may be okay if it's given to you within the time period you need. But of course, private rulings have all these other connotations and other requirements, so there's all this information that's asked for. By the time you might actually get it, you may have made a decision anyway, because you need to move on with your transaction. So I suppose in terms of where we're heading and some of the things I've been involved in, is have a discussion around the transaction, we'll highlight some of the concerns that we may have and ways to mitigate those concerns. And then if that's all you require, we know about it, you know, as long as you keep us informed as, you know, if there's any discrepancy between the way you've actually talked about and the way you've lodged, then I suppose both sides get that sense. Yeah. So, Kate, you had a question? I, I was going to just expand on that to say, uh, being a non, we're not a 200 listed ASX company. We are a large business uh, under the ATO standards. And I've got to tell you, I've, I would find it really difficult to know who to go to to ask those questions yep. without picking the phone up to my advisor and saying, I have a question could you please help me? And then they direct me. I wouldn't sure. know who to, to I, honest, that's an honest response. Yeah, well, it's something we can take on board yep. yeah. Yeah. in terms of communication. I can do a private ruling, I can talk to my advisors, but I don't know who do I speak to at the ATO about big ticket issues. So and you don't have an ATO? No, ATO we're not person. allowed to have one because... You're not, you're not allowed. <laughs> no, we're well, sorry. Yeah. We asked for one and we were told there were none left. So this was... <laughs> right. A couple of years ago I'll we asked you, Kate. I'll help you, Kate. I'll help you. Not to ATO. <laughs> yeah. But so I, I would imagine... Kate wants someone to talk to. So I, cannot, I could not be the only tax person in Australia that doesn't know who to speak to at the ATO. No, Am I right? No, that's... Uh, and for a lot of people, I think the entry point is the phone. And then you might eventually find your way through to a Kate, specialist. Okay, assuming you could find someone. Yes. Okay, and you spoke to somebody and they said, oh, we think that's okay, we think it's low risk. The concern I have with that is that if I've got a private ruling, I'm absolutely guaranteed, yes. provided the facts remain the same. But if I haven't got a private ruling and I've got, yeah, that, that looks fine, that's low risk, two or three years down the track, someone else looks at it yes. with, a very, with a different view. Um, you, d you don't get that. You haven't got that protection. Mm -hmm. You might have had that what you thought was protection three years ago, but now someone else has a different view. Um, so that, uh, I still think there's a gap there, a very big gap between a ruling and, and we are what actually a, what re else is reviewing there. our products. Yes. Uh, and so we, we, um, you, you see actually in the interpretive space that they, they actually um, ask the taxpayer now um, whether they want the full blown ruling or whether they want an abbreviated. Uh, version. So many taxpayers don't really want to know why the answer is what the, what the tax office is given. They just want to know what the answer is. So we do actually give that option, that sort of flexibility. Um, and, but then there's other products as well that we'd, we would like to be able to issue. There's always a question of balance for the tax office though as well between certainty and, and opening up risk. Yep. So if you don't explain a subject fully, People may misunderstand yes. purposefully or or um, by accident. So, you know, the, 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 there's a yeah, there's a question of balance in it. I'm mm -hmm. so um, coming back to um, to Chris's question though. Um, I had time to think about that. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. Uh, <laughs> the um, question was, if you recall, was that um, you know we see many businesses and we see best practice in risk management, and to what extent do we share that? Um, I guess it's talking about it today is part of the sharing. Um, uh, of what we see, you know, uh, the, those, those things I've said to pay attention to so far, and we'll go into more detail. Um, but we do have a couple of publications. I think they're referred to in um, slide seven, large business and tax compliance publication, GST governance and risk management guides for large and SME market taxpayers, and then there's a PSLA. Um, they most probably don't tell the whole story and exactly the same story as I'm telling today, but that's part of the puzzle. Um, we did talk to you last year about uh, 
uh, uh, uh, an assurance model. Um, uh, I think it was this group, wasn't it? Yeah, it was this group, wasn't it? So we spoke to you last year about an assurance model that we were developing. Um, and that's actually got quite a lot uh, about the sort of things that businesses need to pay attention to. I was just looking at it myself yesterday, you know, there's two uh, A3 pages of, of things that you should be doing and checking and processes that you should be taking, uh, to, uh, taking part in. Nigel, do you, um, we will publish it at that one point, but um, maybe we need to think about publishing it a bit wider than the group we're, we're aiming at. You know, just to, to say certainly, is that... Certainly the criteria. Yeah. There's no, there's no reason the criteria can't carry out. Be published on, on the next. Yeah. Mm. So um, it's, it's a good point, though. Um, and, you know, we. Yeah. we just can I ask us. Oh, sorry. So on that point, too, just to apply, because I've recently mm. moved from the, the public group space to the private group space, we're also putting together a, a um, tax governance toolkit of sorts that will work in the private <laughs> group space, recognising the differences between the public groups and the private groups and how they're set up. Obviously, the different you know, widely held shareholding versus the very narrow shareholding, the beneficial ownership versus the legal ownership, and you know the decision maker being the high wealth individual in most cases with their advisors, as opposed to a tax team with their advisors. So we're trying to put that together. So that's just something to recognise as well that that's how we're going to communicate what we expect to have in that space as well, and recognising the differences and also the similarities across private and public groups. So, um, Michael and Steve. You go out to pay a visit to Dale and Chris at Westpac. Yeah. You have a long conversation um, along the lines of what you talked about before, Michael, around their tax risk management framework. At the end of it, you are inspired by what Dale and Chris say. It's the most impressive tax risk management framework you've yeah. ever seen. Oh, you've been there. That's, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I have been there. So, what, <laughs> what, what sign off, what level of assurance do Dale and Chris get that they're right on the money with their tax risk management framework? Um, they'll get the feedback from us, obviously, yep. um, uh, you know, face In, to face. Yep. Um, under this collaborative assurance model that um, I touched upon and we spoke about last year, which we've been developed, um, the, if we were happy that uh, their CFO or CEO was willing to sign up to say that I'm happy with our risks, uh, uh, you know, this appropriately, appropriately being managed according to your criteria, um, then we would actually say, oh, we will, we'll, we'll see you in three years' time. Yeah. So that's the sort of feedback that you'd get so, Chris, under that process. So, what I would what I, what I would expect is a lighter touch. Yeah. So, as, mm -hmm. you know, as Darren raised earlier, sometimes, you know, you're getting the questions on the level of detail of amounts that aren't material. If you yeah. go, if the tax office go through the framework and they're happy with the framework and the processes and the policies and the elevation to board, from a corporate perspective, we would expect that lighter touch on some of these issues. Sure. Yeah. And and look, lighter touch, you know, it's not just a word that we bandy about. It's a reality. Yep. In as much as that, you know, we're in the business of actually helping people get it right, but also finding people who don't get it right. If we can actually see that someone's got the systems and processes in place to get it right first time, then we can we'll, we'll spend our time elsewhere. Yeah. It's as simple as that. You How know? far off is the insurance model? Um, good question. Can I not answer that? Um, <laughs> uh, soon, I'll if you like. Soon. No, can I, can I just say it's soon, yeah. um, which is equally rubbery as yeah. in a while. Mm. Um, I suppose just to, just, just to distract your attention away from the question, um, and going back to the other question, was um, a recent um, publication around our blueprint and how we take that approach that Dale was talking about. It's a tailored approach, a tailored approach based on a like measure of perception of your risk okay, that you present. So tax governance plays a big role in that. So as Dale said, that if we're happy with how they operate and what controls they've got in place around their tax risk and it's quite transparent to us, then the tail approach would be towards that lighter touch. Okay, so on, you may have or you haven't seen, you just go to the ATM website, you'll see our blueprint. I think it's page 12 and 13. We talk about the different levels of touch. Now again, there's a spectrum of touches and I suppose a spectrum of service offerings. So the lighter the touch would also mean that our perception of your risk based on what we've seen is quite low and therefore service levels obviously change and what we can actually offer you as well. So the question you asked Kate about what's available for you, I suppose again resourcing is obviously an issue but 
if you were to fall into the spectrum of that lighter touch, then there's no reason why you couldn't come to us and ask for a similar level of treat treatment, because that's the way we approach all taxpayers. So it, that's the way we have been operating. I suppose it probably hasn't come across like that. I know in the, in the world that I was operating in, and the, Dale was talking about the banking space, it is quite evident. But I suppose for many of you, it may not be so evident. But I suppose now it's, there's the mantra that we do this for everyone. So to make it consistent across it's everyone. Can I just ask, how are these, um, all of these processes, um, if at all, going to affect your risk differentiation process, the more formal one that, that the ATO applies? Um, the risk differentiation process will continue, okay? We see, see the um, different, I don't know what you would call them, products or programs, but risk differentiation um, program will, will continue, like I say. Um, ACAs, you know, th these things will morph as time goes on, um, and there's a, there's quite a lot of intersection between them as well. Yeah. So the co co collaborative assurance model I was talking about as well has got features in that which actually intersect. Mm -hmm. But I guess is that um, the, uh, th that um, yes, what. Sir, I was We'll, we'll stick with the four quadrants, uh, and the things that might change is who do we apply it to, and what's the consequences of applying the model to someone. So if you're in quadrant three, you know, what's our, our response going to be to someone who's low risk and low consequence? Well, I suppose the answer to your question generally is that page 12 and 13 of the blueprint, which actually spells out if you're in a particular part of the spectrum or continuum, the approach we'll take with you is commensurate with your positioning in the RDF. And your position in RDF, amongst many other things, is one of the factors is your tax governance. So, so. Um, the blueprint that Michael's talking about is, you know, the, the, uh, one of our base documents now that we're going to take forward and is how we're going to basically operate. It's so important to us. You, Michael even remembers the page numbers, right? 12 and 13. <laughs> and I think, he's referring to paragraph, I, to. I think he's referring to paragraph 4 of page 12. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just before we leave that. Sorry. An observation more slash comment. I think it is very important that we realise that tax risk frameworks are not one fits everybody. Yeah. Yep. And I'm a bit concerned about your approach, Chris, of saying that you know if, if Westpac has an ideal one, that should be rolled out across the board. Because I think it does have to be very appropriate to the individual company. Yeah. Uh, and what may be perfect for a multinational bank may not be equally perfect for any other organisation. And I think hopefully the tax office will realise that. Yeah, no, we can. Um, we have, that you we then have, have yeah. if, if someone has a system which has you know pages and pages of checklists and things, you don't think that everyone has to have that same system because it's clearly not appropriate, uh, and you have to judge into each individual business based on its individual circumstances. Yeah, no, I, I I'd entirely agree with you. That's um, right. It, it just makes um, perfect sense. Dudley, yep. where I, where I was going with that question um, was it had sort of teased it out. Um, was a bit around. So, so let's say, let's go back to the Westpac example. Uh, Dale and Chris have the best tax risk management framework in the country for them. Um, what they, what we've heard is they'll get a light touch as a result. They're still a key taxpayer, but they will get a light touch from the commissioner by virtue of the commissioner having the comfort that that is there. But I, I, is it fair to say? Dale and Chris aren't going to get a letter from the ATO that they can take to Michael Barber and say what a fantastic job they've done for their year end. There, there's um, no sort of, uh, there's no uh, sign off type. Um, well, there, there is with the RDF with certain categories of Correct. risk so. differentiation framework. Um, Michael Barber would be in conversation with us, or we'd send a note to Chris saying what an excellent job you've done. You know, it could, you, could so well you would, be in you that would form. write and say this. We're very. We're very impressed with this tax risk management framework. The, yeah. It meets our requirements. Um, would you? We, we wouldn't do that as a matter of course. Correct. Um, you wouldn't? No. No, no. no. What we would say is that based on what we've understood of how you operate and the, the policies, systems, procedures, controls you have in place, we can understand how you operate and how you manage your risk. Now, because we understand that and then it's, a, it's open and transparent for us, if something was to arise, we can have that conversation that will be a lighter touch because we know how the outcome will be. And we would expect the reciprocated response would be they come and talk to us about it as well in that pre-lodgement space. So it opens up a conversation. Now, there, there, there are current products in place around you know, annual compliance arrangements and, and pre-lodgement compliance reviews that I'm fully familiar with in the large business space, in the private group space. 
Um, we haven't decided what products to go in that space. If we're, I think the, the, the way to go is approaches as opposed to products, you know, because the approach then reflects the continuum and the blueprint about the, uh, the way in which we interact with you and our tailored approach to you. So the, as I mentioned earlier, the governance aspect is one mechanism by which we can assess your risk or perceive your risk in the spectrum of the RDF. So if we can understand how you operate and you're transparent with us, of course there'll be a lot of touch. So there's that word again, transparency. Okay. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. the last point on the, the slide there is about working collaboratively with the ATO, which Michael yeah. has touched on a few times. Share your information with the tax office, reduce your compliance costs and promote a positive working relationship. Um, more and more, we look at uh, transparency as being one of those indicators of potential risk. Um, so, so once we're, where we're closed to, some, to someone or someone's closed to us, um, you know, it, it, it does create a concern. Uh, and where someone is open, um, then that gives us reassurance uh, that uh, people are, are doing the right thing in the right way. So very, very important that where you can have a relationship, and it doesn't work for everyone, where you can have a relationship through your client relationship manager, say, um, then please use that um, because it's one of our main, main ways of actually um, making a judgment about where you sit on the risk continuum. Um, just talking about risk, I um, did a bit of research and I found a story about risk. So I'll share it with you at the moment. Is there, are there any um, accountants in today? You can put your hand up. I'm sure there must be loads. Yeah. Okay. No, don't be, don't be shy. Put your hand up. <laughs> okay. So, uh, and yeah, actuaries. Any actuaries? Now, I didn't expect to have any actuaries, but it's an actuarial joke, okay? So, or an actuarial <laughs> story. But it tells you something about risk. If you could just imagine the scenario is that there's three accountants are going to go off to a risk management conference, and there's three actuaries are going to go off to a risk management conference, and they gather at the train station, okay? So the actuaries, they each go to the ticket counter and buy a ticket each because that's what actuaries do. Uh, and, but the accountants, right, they go to the counter and they only buy one ticket between the three of them. Now, the actuaries are looking at this and going, that's a bit odd, isn't it? So they get on the train. Anyway, the three actuaries sit down each with their ticket, okay, wait for the ticket collector. The three accountants with one ticket pile into the toilet, okay, into the, into the, the small toilet. So the train pulls out of the station. Anyway, the ticket collector comes along eventually and he goes to the actuaries and he gets the ticket off of each of them, punch the ticket, fine. He notices there's someone in the toilet. So he goes over to the toilet, knocks on the door. Out comes a hand with a ticket. He punches the ticket, the hand goes back. Okay, there's three inside though. So the, the actuaries think, this is brilliant. This is absolutely brilliant. Why don't we do this on the way back? So the actuaries, they buy themselves one ticket to come on the way back. Okay. And they observe that the accountants don't buy any tickets. Right? No ticket at all for the three, of the, the three accountants. So the actuaries pile into the toilet. Right? And the, act, uh, the actuaries pile into the toilet, the three of them, with their one ticket. And the accountants go into a nearby toilet. No ticket. So the train pulls out. What do you think happens? Has anyone got any idea? Someone over here, have you, have you heard this? They tap the door and... When the ticket comes out, they take the ticket and go. That's exactly it, right? So what happens is the train pulls out, the actuary, one of them comes out the toilet, goes to the accountant's door, knocks on it, takes the ticket, goes back. <laughs> right. Okay. <laughs> Mate, oh, I thought it was good anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so um, no, some of you are still processing that, right? So <laughs> but that's okay. So that's okay. Elements of um, good tax risk management. Steve, I was just going to ask a question. Yeah, sure. It seems to me that one dimension of managing contentious or uncertain issues for a tax manager is understanding if the tax office have a different view from, for example, what may be accepted as an industry view or a, what, what, what the corporate has yeah. as a view of a particular tax issue. Yeah. And obviously the public rulings process is intended to... Um, advertise, for want of a better word, the tax office views on particular issues. But can you, are you able to make any observations on how issues that are contentious or that where the tax office has a different view potentially from 
what, what may be an accepted view within the profession, what may be an accepted view within an industry, how those issues, if you like, get played out. Ed, ed out. Yeah. There's, there's most probably a, a couple of routes. Um, I guess is the, in the early days of GST, when there was many issues where there might have been a difference of opinion, the, the main vehicle for airing the views, I guess, was through the public ruling process. Uh, and that included, you know, public consultation, rulings panel, etc. So the views, you know, each each of the views could be heard. Um, but um, in more recent times, um, you know, auditors will go out. They'll find a taxpayer that, that would disagree with. Perhaps the whole whole industry would disagree. Uh, and you might well find is that there's an assessment issued followed by objection and litigation. There's another way. Um, that uh, matters uh, are resolved. More and more, the tax office is preferring to actually say, look, whilst we disagree, is the scope for a dispute resolution other than going through the expensive courts uh, and it's cheaper for everyone? Um, and then, as well, sometimes that will be a private situation of settlement, perhaps, if dispute resolution goes that way, and sometimes it will be a public way of, uh, uh, way of uh, resolving the dispute. So if generally, though, if it applies to a broader community uh, or broader group of taxpayers, we would get to the point of publishing a, a, a view. Mm. And we still do. You know, we're still producing rulings about um, matters where there might be, might be tension. Mm. And um, you know, I deal with those matters on a day-to-day -day basis. And some of, the, some of the issues are at different stages. You know, some are just with one taxpayer. Some are with a group of taxpayers. Some are in dispute resolution. Um, so there's a, well, I guess is that I've just described a whole host of avenues for um, uh, resolving um, differences of opinion. Mm. I suppose I can add to that too. Um, in my former life as the um, National Director for Banking Risk and Strategy, one mechanism that we employed was actually having a strategy document with things that attract our attention or contentious parts of tax law, which we then discussed with the industry liaison bodies. And in the banking space, that was the Australian Bank Association and the Australian Financial Market Association, so the domestic and foreign bank groupings. We'd then have a discussion with them what they thought you know, were the key points, and then we'd actually put them on the agenda to talk. Now, there's also the NTLG, you know, that things were, you know, I suppose, raised and discussed there. But the strategy documents were just, I'm saying about banking, but across the, because most of you, I'm assuming, are from the large business space, the, the public groups, you know, the industry associations around banking, mining and energy, you know, services, you know, manufacturing, each one had their own independent strategy about what things attracted their attention and what things could be added to that strategy to discuss. Now, you may recall earlier I discussed, you know, there's a point around low dollar value things that the ATM may look at. But I raised the point that those low dollar things across numerous hundreds, thousands of taxpayers could be quite material. So having an understanding of how the law works and whether it actually works as intended is also good for us to know through these mechanisms. So sometimes, like I said, when we look at things, it's not just necessarily from the individual taxpayer space, it's from the larger, is the tax system working as intended? So those strategy documents, and some of you may or may not be familiar with them because you may not be on those bodies, but they do filter and they are published. So they should be available for you to look at to see what things are attracting our attention, how we're going to operate, and how we're going to resolve things. So one of some of the mechanisms Steve's talked about, but there are other mechanisms. I suppose an, an, an example in that banking space, some of you may be familiar with the administrative solution around the, um, I suppose, the removal of the AUD LIBOR issue. Now, Treasury, I think it was noted earlier, had limited resources to actually change the law, and without a law change, the law was ineffective in terms of creating a cap, as intended by the law. So myself and others in that, in that strategy space had discussions with AFMA, the industry body that it was affected the foreign banks, and came up with an administrative solution based on a BBSW proxy to overcome that issue. So there's, there's more than one way that we're looking at to resolve things rather than just in the public ruling space that are commercially driven, allow you to lower your compliance costs and also to have this, I suppose, mutual certainty about how to operate. So we're not looking about removing or eliminate, eliminating risk altogether. That's never going to happen. But if we can mitigate it to a significant degree where both parties understand that there's probably a very low chance of compliance risk being raised with you, you know, if you operate and implement it as, in, as we've discussed. That's way, one way of resolving it as well before a dispute arises. Okay, thanks, Michael. Yep. And I guess in that context, a challenge um, is going to be consistency and fairness of application. 
yeah. yes. particularly where you know you're, you're engaging um, in a private sense, yeah. uh, and then how you apply that more broadly and get, and maintaining that confidence yep. in the in the taxpayer community that those decisions yes. are being applied Correct. consistently. Yeah. And what raises there is the issue around the the. You know, 2011-27 practice statement, PSLA 2011-27, around potential U-turns. So that's, I suppose, in the reverse of what we're discussing. That's <coughs> governance on the tax office side to make sure that consistent decisions where there are similar material facts, you know, the decisions actually are implemented in the same way. So that's something, you know, we'll have to look at as well. But you're right, though. You know, the managing, if you start talking about dispute resolution, managing consistency is something that we're very keen to keep our eye on. Yeah. Um, so, and I can think of examples we currently got at the moment where we might be talking to one taxpayer, but re very cognizant that there's actually a whole group of taxpayers that might be in similar situations. Uh, and so, um, what our ambition is that we actually treat them all similarly, recognizing that some might have slightly different circumstances. Um, but gen uh, is a general thrust. You know, our widely based settlements panel, which has been running for years, has had to tackle with this very issue uh, for, for a long time. And so um, it's not new to us, but I think with us increasingly using dispute resolution, it's something we need to keep a, a, keep a good eye on. Um, this slide here is most probably the last Steve, one I'll I show you. We've got a question. Yeah, started. sure. Got a quick question for Michael. Um, you mentioned the ATO's policy of sometimes I might look at smaller amounts if they think it might affect other taxpayers and it would be a, a law um, application issue. Is there a policy within the ATO to communicate that to taxpayers? Um, or, again, it goes to sort of consistency and ensuring that communication lines are established properly? I don't think, I wouldn't call it a policy of looking at smaller issues. I think it's a case by case basis. But if there are. Sorry. Um, not so much looking at those issues, but communicating the reasons why you sure. might be looking at something. So, yep. you know, taxpayers not second guessing. Well, that's unusual and sort of it helps build that relationship in the review process as well. Yeah. I suppose when it comes to larger issues, one of the issues I'll talk about this afternoon, um, sorry, this morning, um, before lunch, when everyone's going to be really excited to hear about it, is around the residual tax cost setting amounts and RTFI issues. So, in, in my presentation, I'm talking about some of you may receive the letter. So, that's the type of communication to achieve a consistent outcome for everyone. We're doing a program across something that may not be material for you, but maybe for someone else. But to achieve that consistency and application of those very complex rules, we're looking at everyone that may be involved and across the different you know, size of the groups as well, right? so that we're doing that way. So when we say policy, it's more about common sense. So if we are aware that it may affect more than one taxpayer you know, with the same facts, or it's an industry-wide issue, then we would communicate it. So like I said, there are industry bodies that we can do that through. And we have continued to do that through. The number of consultation forums have obviously reduced um, as, as a result of the Commissioner coming in saying there's far too many of them, which I have to agree there was far too many and spend most of your time going to, going to forums and not actually doing what you're supposed to be doing. So it's good that they've reduced and they've been much more effective in doing so. So part of that communication goes through that forums. There's also our external website, okay, where they can come up. It may be difficult to navigate and that's an, it's a work in progress as well. But that's another mechanism. And there's also obviously these sort of channels that we go through. There's also the commissioner speeches, second commissioner speeches, deputy commissioner speeches it, that are relevant and they may raise these things as well. So there's numerous forums we can do that through. So Chris, five minutes. Saying, Chris has just told minutes. me five minutes. Mm. <laughs> so I'm um, trying subtly to tell you that, Steve. All right, yeah. okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> By doing this. <laughs> well, that's okay. I'm, um, so, look, I don't need to go through all the slides anyway. Um, I think um, we've maybe, most probably covered the main messages, but this last slide I think is, is very important. It's just one way of looking at risk management from a strategic or an operational viewpoint. So what makes a, a good, risk, a good tax risk management framework from a strategic perspective? Now, think strategic. That's your whole of business, right? That's about your livelihood. That's about your existence. Uh, when you think about strategy and tax risk. So what's really important um, at a strategic level is that the actual business understands where it positions itself from a risk appetite point of view. Okay, so we see situations where someone down here is playing a risky game when yet the board up here don't want any risk at all or very minimal risk. 
And the, what happens is there's a disconnect in the organisation, whether it's a cultural disconnect, you know, they don't understand what the culture of the organisation may be. Um, I'm, I'm not sure, but it, clearly there's a lack of communication. Um, so if you, at a strategic level, you need to understand and also agree within your organisation what your risk appetite is. What is appropriate risk management in your organisation? Is no risk the acceptable limit or some risk or lots of risk? Now you need to, to um, in, in, in finding that out, you need to consider the board. Um, uh, your shareholders may also be a stakeholder in this. Um, uh, your peers, if you think about your position in your industry as well, may be an issue that affects your uh, risk appetite. Think about what the media might respond, how the media might respond. Uh, tax is a hot issue. We see a lot about tax in the media just at the moment. Um, so, uh, and think about how the community might respond about your business's reputation and, and confidence in that business in relation to risk. And, and, and importantly as well, I stress, Think about your relationship with the ATO uh, and um, uh, when you're thinking about your risk appetite. Um, it, it is important. Tax can uh, impact upon the viability of your, of your business. Um, and also as well is that within your business you need to think about tax, not just as tax general, but different types of taxes might have different risk profiles and different thresholds as well. So you have to think about all the different components of the tax. And think about having an engagement strategy at a high level with the, with the tax office. What would that look like? On a practical level, which is the operational level, which is mostly where people think uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, then you're talking about what the role, you know, a good tax framework has actually defined roles and responsibilities. Uh, and it goes without saying, you know, systems, controls, resourcing, all the stuff that I mentioned a bit earlier is really important. Um, automation, especially when it comes to GST, you know, GST is a, a flow-through tax that you just have to manage, but you have to have the systems to manage that. Um, and also as well, the thing that we see where there is a disconnect in risk management frameworks is between those that make the policy and write the guidelines and those that actually in the business, never mind in a tax manager's office, but those in the business that might need to apply those policies. There's often a disconnect there. So if you're a tax manager, you know, um, are you getting the advice out to those businesses that might need to operate uh, some part of the tax uh, system within your business? Um, and when you actually speak to them, are you gathering the ro appropriate facts about the transactions that are going on? Are you getting in early enough uh, to find out those transactions? Uh, and then once you're a tax manager and you've said, oh yeah, this is how we're going to treat this, then it's a matter of implementing and making sure that people toe the line as well as to a certain, you know, the, are people following the advice that you as a tax person might be giving within the business? And finally, the um, some pragmatic um, uh, approaches to getting things right. Um, this is more so on the income tax side of things, but ensure your tax outcomes align with the business outcomes. So there you're talking about, you know, the, the, the you know, you're talking about, um, well, Michael and, uh, and Sandra will probably talk more about this, but it's about, you know, are your tax results aligned with your business results? Um, and there might be reasons why they're not aligned, but you need to explain that. Um, and also as well ensure your systems are working properly. Um, streamlined automation, I've already said, that's really the key um, and that creates efficiency and effectiveness um, and takes the human out of the, uh, the potential for mistake. Okay, now if anyone wants to know what the benefit of doing all this is, I asked an actuary, okay? This one's a terrible joke too much, probably. But <laughs> I'm going to do it, okay, as a parting gift from the tax office. So I asked an actuary, I said, uh, what's the return on risk management? Why would anyone, and he got a calculator out. He said, well, there's two main things here. You could calculate return on investment in risk management. Well, you all know the stitch in time saves nine, yeah? And also you know as an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. A uh, pound is 16 ounces, yeah? So 9 plus 16 is 25, divided by 2, the average return on investment is 12 and a half. Okay, so you take that back to your CEO <laughs> uh, and try and explain that to him. So that one went down like a lead balloon as well. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, 
I won't be using those jokes again. Yeah. Fortunately, this is the last time I have to do this, but, um, okay. uh, but it's the first time and the last time. But uh, no, I appreciate you listening and um, uh, try and join in a bit more. Um, but thanks to the panel as well. And I think we're going to switch over to, to someone else. Uh, <laughs> so we're now going to hear from um, Sandra on international for 30 minutes. Um, and this, uh, in previous sessions, um, and I, I think most people know there was a session run yesterday um, as well. And the International has been a, a very interesting session because it's very topical at the moment. One only has to open up each day's spin review to see uh, that this is, a, this is a focus area in 2015 for tax. So um, over to Sandra on that note. Thank you very much and thanks for inviting me to talk about international tax risk management today and hopefully to answer any questions you might have. Um, so I'm currently in the public groups and international area of the ATO where I provide leadership to compliance teams who are primarily working on cases involving international structuring and profit shifting, tax risks. Um, I'll try to draw upon my experiences and what I've seen in some of those cases as much as I can today to make it more practical, um, but please ask any questions as we go along. Um, as mentioned, international tax is certainly the flavour of the month or, or the year, as I say, and this is highlighted by the recent Senate committee hearings into corporate tax avoidance. Um, it's of course important to note that it's neither a new nor a recent phenomenon. However, it is growing and as stated by the ATO in its submission to the hearing, for the 2012-13 financial years, international related party dealings accounted for half of Australia's global trade. The Commissioner made it quite clear at the hearing that the ATO believes the majority of corporates do pay the right amount of tax in Australia and importantly are open and transparent in their dealings with us. However, he also stated that there are a small minority who try to avoid their obligations and when the ATO finds evidence on deliberate non-compliance, we take strong and determined action. At the recent hearing, Commissioner stated the ATO takes a more reasonable approach for the vast majority of those who try to do the right thing and will take a far more assertive approach to the harder edge aspects of corporate and international tax. The pace of change in international tax is fast and the global response signals a new era in managing international tax policy on the global stage. So today we'll talk about some of the international and local developments. I won't dwell too long on them. Um, the nature of some of the international tax risks that the ATO might review, uh, some best practice governance tips and we'll also go through a case study. So Australia is an active member of the OECD, which is doing extensive work to address a base erosion and profit shifting, or BEPS. Uh, don't want to spend too long on it, but the current BEPS action plan is a key aspect of the global approach to international tax. There are 15 action items which cover the main issues seen as problematic in the current tax environment. These include the digital economy, uh, which is action item one. Um, while this, the digital economy does not generate unique BEPS issues, some of its key features exacerbate BEPS. Uh, in particular the reliance on intangible assets and the difficulty in determining where value creation occurs. Uh, another example is hybrid, which is action item two, hybrid mismatches. Um, this will occur when arrangement is characterised differently in jurisdictions for tax purposes. Uh, may give rise to double deductions or a deduction in one, so in one country which is not matched by accessibility in another country. Um, OECD's September 2014 report proposes standardised domestic rules to be applied in these situations. Um, we're also seeing a rewrite of the 2010 transfer pricing guidelines with some uh, you know, intangible reports already being issued. Um, the policy response at the OECD level will involve changes to the model treaty provisions, multilateral instruments, country by country reporting and CFC and permanent establishment changes. Recent changes to international tax from an Australian perspective obviously include the new transfer pricing rules in Div 815. Uh, they're designed to align Australia's transfer pricing legislation with the OECD transfer pricing guidelines. It brings transfer pricing into the uniform administrative penalty regime and importantly it brings transfer pricing into self-assessment regime as well. Um, we've seen the Foreign Account Tax Compliance Act, FATCA, which requires financial institutions to report to the ATO in the 2015 calendar year account information which is held by US citizens, US residents or US entities. Uh, there's also been the tightening of the thin capitalisation safe harbour limits effective for income years starting on or after 1 July 2014. 
under the common reporting standard uh, rules, uh, jurisdictions will obtain financial information from their financial institutions and automatically exchange the information with other jurisdictions annually. And the government has announced it will implement the OECD common reporting standard for the automatic exchange of financial account information <coughs> from 1st of January 2017. And the OECD has also released guidance on transfer pricing documentation and country by country reporting. Um, we can clearly see across these initiatives uh, themes of increased transparency and disclosure. So what's the ATO look for? So we generally use data matching and analytics to identify tax risks. Uh, these risk filters are designed to identify quantitative indicators of international tax risks. So usually we would look at things like a comparison of an entity's financial and or tax performance relative to its industry peers. Uh, trends over a number of years and whether there have been any significant changes in related party dealings over time. Uh, we'll look at the actual international dealing schedule itself, uh, whether there have been any new international related party dealings. Um, an entity may suddenly start to pay a royalty uh, or there may be new uh, management fees paid offshore or there may be a substantial increase in, the, in those labels and that will definitely uh, sort of uh, spark our attention. Uh, related party debt is also a focus, so if there's any related party loans in or out, we will also seek to look at that. Um, international related party dealings with uh, entities located in tax havens will also likely get flagged by us. Um, the documentation status label on the IDS, um, obviously if you say no documentation you'll probably get picked up as well. Um, and Restructuring activities, if there's any sale of intellectual property or other intangibles or sale of any CFCs or other property offshore, that will also spark our attention. Uh, a key governance issue that we often see is sometimes the IDS uh, schedules and even the tax return, the labels aren't filled out correctly um, and if that gets picked up by our risk filter, um, you know, obviously we don't sit in the organisation, we, we can't tell that the label has actually been just filled incorrectly. So I think it's, it's important that you're careful in how, in how you actually fill out the IDS and how you fill out your tax return and that the correct information is being put into those forms. Um, the ATO will also look closely at the revaluation of assets for thin capitalisation, particularly with the tightening of the safe harbour limits. Um, not all cases that, that sort of move into review stage will arise only from the risk filters. Um, we'll also use intelligence from other areas. Uh, we may see systemic issues in our rulings program or in other compliance activities, which may lead to an industry or issue-wide project being undertaken. Um, and while we don't audit by media, we may identify activities through the media or through company press releases or annual reports, which will also pique our interest. Um, as we are moving to prevention, we will often seek to liaise with taxpayers while a transaction is happening to ensure that the correct treatment is decided upon before <coughs> uh, the tax return is lodged. I don't know if the panel had any issues or any, or any sort of thoughts on how um, their, I suppose, their experience with the ATO uh, picking their entity, their company for reviews or any tax risks. Um. Can I ask a question before we get into that? Does the tax office take any different risk assessment to a company that is inbound, so a subsidiary of an offshore company, as compared with an Australian company that is outbound. Is there any different assessment of the tax risk associated with being a foreign, a subsidiary of a foreign parent versus an Australian parent? I think a, there's definitely, obviously, um, in terms of the way the risk filters are designed, I mean, as I said, that's uh, their sort of quantitative data. So that, that's run over tax returns in general. But um, I think Michael alluded to earlier things like strategy documents. So if you were to look at the international risk strategy documents, there would be different risk that we would be looking at depending on whether you're an Australian subsidiary of a foreign multinational or whether you're an Australian entity that has offshore subsidiaries. So uh, when we come up with the strategies for international tax, yes, we do differentiate. What if you're both? What if you're a subsidiary of an international company that also has international companies itself. Then you'd fall into both. So, you know, as an example, an, <laughs> then you're as an, example an Australian company. Um, <laughs> I, suppose, I suppose one way of looking at it is there's different pieces of legislation that apply those to di those different circumstances. And different pieces of legislation have, I suppose, 
um, attracted more attention than others in recent past, so I won't go beyond that. But it depends on your structuring as well. Now, in the, the, to a certain, we'll probably talk about structuring anyway. And you know, the more complex the structure, the more unexplainable it is by commercial rationale, obviously the more questions we'll be asking. So irrespective of where you are, whether you're foreign owned or domestically owned and operate overseas, it's how you operate you know, and what you do and how you utilise the tax laws. And risk filters is one way of doing that. And that's a quantitative approach. And we all know that's not perfect and it's subject to continuous review. I suppose another way of looking at it is the qualitative aspects. And we mentioned earlier, talking to you, understanding your business, understanding your flow business. So what may look complex, and I've heard this before, what's complex to you isn't complex for us. So having the understanding of you know, your flow business and then having that minor aspect of the non-flow, we can then carve out all the flow business and all the perceived risks that are not really risks and just look at mitigating those things that are in the non-flow part of the business, irrespective of where you actually originate from. Sandra, um, has the tax office um, lowered its threshold as to what it considers acceptable as to what it may have looked at years ago and thought, well, that's OK? Now you look at it in a different lens and you um, raise the bar to say, well, no, we, don't, we no longer accept that as, as OK. When you say threshold, do you mean as a dollar value? Uh, no, not just in terms of what, what, whatever it is that someone might be doing overseas. Um, you might have looked at it years ago and thought that makes sense. And now you look at it and say, well, actually, we don't think it makes sense anymore. Where, where nothing may have changed, mm. but you're placing a different lens on it. Is that? I think the way we approach things now and the way, you know, my experience with how compliance teams approach things is exactly what Michael said. Uh, is it commercial? So. I can't really talk to what lens was placed on things years ago, but right now we are looking at, you know, is what has been entered into a commercial arrangement um, and does it pass, you know, that commerciality test? Um, so... I'll just add, I suppose another aspect of looking at it is things that have a cross-jurisdictional uh, cross components. In the past, there may not have been obvious to us about the implications and the consequences of that structuring. In recent years, there's been a lot of, I suppose, academic profession, the academic profession in the OECD discussing things like hybrid mismatches, transparent entities, flow-through conduits, which just applying the law itself may be okay, but the way it's structured and the commercial reasons for it weren't as evident as they were in the past as they are now, given the advent of the you know, increase in digital technology, information exchanges, and you would have seen you know, the increase in uh, EOI powers and the... the um, I forgot the other one where you actually uh, be able to exchange information between jurisdictions that were once known as tax havens to remove that. So with the advent of us having more information, the advent of smarter data initiatives in the office, understanding that holistic picture and how it works, and we've always been told that large corporates operate on a global effective tax rate as opposed to just one jurisdiction, having that under full understanding will be positioned us much better to answer that question, I suppose. Can I ask a follow-up question to Karen's question? You might you might not uh, be able or want to answer this question, but um, if you go back to, and one reads the transcripts of the Senate inquiry into corporate tax avoidance, we see some very big names appearing before that inquiry. Some of those are top Australian companies with a huge tax presence here, 50 to 100 tax people looking after the tax affairs and the Australian tax affairs. But there are other big name corporates there that have, um, from what I understand, zero Australian tax expertise in house. All tax um, expertise will be managed out of London or Seattle or somewhere overseas. Is there any, is there any difference in approach by the ATO to those two types of corporates? I mean, I have a lot of experience in dealing with the latter, which is with the, um, you know, the Australian subsidiaries of the foreign multinationals who might not have um, extensive tax experience in Australia. And it'd be the expectation of the ATO that we would have access to people who are able to explain the tax consequences of what's happened. Because ultimately, these entities are required to lodge tax returns in Australia, um, and they would have to do so on the basis of... Uh, the correct information. Now, whether that's done, whether that's, you know, a question was posited yesterday about risks of offshoring um, tax compliance. I mean, that's fine. Um, your tax compliance can be done somewhere else, but um, you need to be able to explain to the ATO everything that's in that tax return. 
um, because ultimately it's being lodged by you. And just one other question, Sandra, in relation to the your comment that you have you look at indicators relative to industry peers. I mean, obviously the tax office has a little bit of an advantage there because you get to see, you get to compare the tax results for different taxpayers and yep. you have that information in-house. So without suggesting that you should share that information publicly, are there particular sources of international um, data that the tax office rely upon that you could at least notify uh, taxpayers, corporate taxpayers. The, you know, if you, if, for example, if you're looking to do a cross-border loan transaction, these are these are the rating agencies that we use. These are the, the these are the these are the the external providers of comparable data that you would rely upon that would help corporates to yep. manage their own tax risk without revealing, if you like, the, the detail, the comparisons between tax Yeah, payments. it's it's a good point. And I think recently uh, the ATO has moved to simplify transfer pricing uh, for the smaller business uh, group of taxpayers. So I think, you know, if there's a loan under a, a certain amount, um, you can use, uh, the, I think, the uh, Reserve Bank rate, I can't, not, off the top of my head, I'm not sure, but there is a rate where we said, okay, you can use this rate for loans under this amount. Um, if you're a distributor with turnover over a particular amount, again, we basically say this is acceptable from our point of view. Um, obviously, as the dollar level increases, so does the risk, and that's where it becomes a bit risky for the ATO to go out and say, you know, for any entities engaged in any sort of loan, uh, regardless of what the, the amount is, this is the rate you can use. So we've put thresholds to make it easier for, for smaller businesses. Um, it does become difficult for high dollar transactions for us to be able to put out that sort of data. Well, why is, sorry, why is that? Why, why can't there be safe harbour for the big end of town as well? Because sometimes for the big end of town, it, the actual transaction that has been entered into, it won't be as simple as a loan. So let's just say it was a straight out loan at the big end of town. Yeah. There's nothing stopping your transfer pricing documentation to say, well, we're going to use this particular rate. And this is the a published rate on a particular, you know, our, rate, our credit rating is the following and based on, you know, the cut method, this is what our, our rate is. Often though, we will see more intricacies than just a simple loan, you know, an inbound loan or an outbound loan. There's often a lot more bells and whistles which are attached, which makes the pricing of that a lot more difficult. And actually identifying what are the arm's length conditions that should attach to that transaction, it's a lot more difficult than just what you might see at the smaller end of town, which may just be a you know, a loan of X amount of dollars. I think that's a difficulty that we face. Well, one other comment on, on, on extending that a little. I mean, uh, I think it's difficult to give a one-size-fits-all uh, interest rate for corporates from, you know, the, the biggest corporates in Australia to the smallest. And that's because interest rates are a reflection of the credit risk of the, um, of the borrower, generally, and uh, subject to arguments um, that... Federal Court might enlighten us on um, towards the end of this year, maybe even the attributes of the um, of the lender. So, uh, of course, if you're a AAA rated company, you're going to be able to access capital markets at a particular level. If you're a sub investment grade um, company, then obviously the interest rates you're going to pay are a lot higher. So, I think that's the difficulty when you when you're looking at the arm's length standard um, credit uh, rating impacts on price. Yeah, but you could presumably, for different credit rating corporates, provide a range or an indication of the, these rates are acceptable. Of what's acceptable, yeah. I mean, it's not. Yeah, it, it wouldn't need to be a one size fits all. It could be a. It could be an approach that applies, you know, subject to whatever your credit rating. Yep. So, happy to take that on notice, and I'm not sure if there are further developments in the ATO about possibly going down that path? I was just going to say that there might be more large organisations out there too that actually have smaller balances. They may not necessarily be involved in huge transactions overseas, but they then get swept up into all of these rules and regulations because they happen to be a large taxpayer. They may not be an international large taxpayer by standard.
archetypal stuff could be useful in that sense. I mean, you know, using that sort of information would fit into um, you know, that sort of list. You can have a list that way there. So it's as though it can't be done in that sense, and the ATO has done it in the past for a similar thing. <laughs> Tony, can you just repeat that question? Because I'm conscious we've got web, WebEx people. Oh, sorry. So they the, um, heard what you are. the comment was just simply that uh, Kay's comment about having a list of uh, rates and what have you. Um, we do know that the ATO, if the AFMA submission about LIBOR, you know, that presented that exact table valuation. So it is possible to do it there in that sense. That's all. It's just a comment yeah. rather than a... Particularly if they're, like, if everyone's using this information, it seems like we're all inventing or we, you know, reinventing the wheel when you've got the, all this information at your hand that perhaps you could provide, the ATO could provide a little bit more guidance so that we wouldn't have to pay hundreds of thousands of dollars to get our documentation in order. I think we acknowledge the point and, again, happy to take on notice, as I mentioned. Uh, so in terms of um, sort of best practice governance, um, you know, ultimately the key to a taxpayer's governance in relation to international tax risk is to ensure that it can demonstrate that its transactions comply with the law and transfer pricing documentation, uh, certainly a key element of this, but it's not the only element. Um, some of the other things we might look at are uh, thin capitalisation working papers, working papers that sit behind the international dealing schedule. So um, I think all that sort of uh, documentation lends itself to managing international tax risk. Um, a couple of notes about transfer pricing documentation. So the ATO has recently issued um, taxation ruling 2014-8, uh, which contains a lot of detail about what we expect to see in transfer pricing documentation. Uh, it's not mandatory, but it's, it's part of good governance and uh, lack of any documentation will put the onus on the taxpayer to explain why a transaction is arm's length. Uh, it needs to be contemporaneous and prepared <coughs> prior to lodgement of the tax return. Uh, a degree of detail and comprehensiveness is required um, and they should document the process undertaken to identify the arm's length conditions and they select the most appropriate and reliable method or combination of methods. Uh, importantly, under the new transfer pricing rules, if an entity does not have appropriate transfer pricing documentation, the penalty provisions will apply as though the matter was not reasonably arguable. So a common question that, that is asked is, you know, what should the documentation look like? Um, the form of it, uh, you know, that's really up to the taxpayer, but um, uh, the tax ruling does provide details about what it should contain, so what should be the substance of that documentation. Uh, and the ruling puts forward five questions that an entity should ask itself when considering the documentation. What are the actual conditions? So what's actually happened? What are the comparable circumstances? What are the particulars of the method used? What are the arm's length conditions? and have any material changes or updates been identified and documented. And in documenting commercial or financial relations between the parties, consideration should be given to all the dealings. So this might include uh, structural charts, or organisational charts, uh, internal procedures and controls, uh, the functions, assets, risks, corporate plans, corporate strategies. Um, consideration should be given to all those in actually working out what the commercial or financial relations are. Um, but ultimately, I suppose the key issue we'd be looking for is that you will be able to demonstrate to us that the arrangement that you've entered into is commercial, so that there's a commercial rationale or purpose which underpins the transaction. And you should also be able to show transparency in your arrangements and dealings. Again, whether this is through the documentation itself or through other means, you know, independent valuations or other independent uh, documentation that's been put together. Uh, you should also ensure yourself that the outcomes are commercially realistic. So the commercial rationale for the arrangement, you know, what we might call the why, why an arrangement has been entered into, that's one part. Uh, but we will also be looking at the how. So how has a transaction been implemented? Um, so we'll test the pricing, but we'll also test the structuring. Um, and if we see transactions which have been entered into uh, differently than we would expect to see independent parties do, we will also question that. So you need to be satisfied that what you have done is what parties acting at arm's length would do. And is it something that you can see being done in the open market? Um, as I said, the actual form of the documentation, that will depend on you know, the, the, the circumstances, including the nature of the related party dealing itself. Um, we have seen, uh, during our review processes, subsidi Australian subsidiaries of foreign multinationals 
uh, whose documentation is not very robust. Um, so just as an example, uh, we're currently auditing an entity who uh, transferred assets to a Singapore-related party for nil consideration. Uh, there was no documentation at all um, uh, on the basis that uh, a decision was made that it didn't fall within the business uh, restructure rules in our ruling. Um, so I think a question that entities should ask themselves objectively is, you know, is this transaction something that the ATO might be interested in? And as I mentioned before, any restructuring that involves uh, sales offshore will usually pique our interest. Um, Can I ask a question on the documentation side? In that, would you, um, the ATO, would you provide, would you be more comfortable in having a nice big glossy report from an outside <coughs> big four slash boutique firm or would an internal, how do you feel about seeing internal documentation? Uh, I don't think there is a preference for who pulls the documentation together so long as what it contains uh, is fit for purpose. So, you know, a glossy document, if, if that's the way you want to go and it, it contains everything we require, then so be it. But if you've also got the in-house ability to be able to put that document together and explain to us that what has been entered into is commercial, um, again, I, I don't think there's a particular preference for who puts it together, so long as it's done appropriately. Sorry, can, can I just address Kate's point there as well? Um, the big four may be good, but you tend to know your industry better than yes. they know their industry, and transfer pricing is about pricing the transactions. Yep. So, yeah, I think internal documentation. It's done. Um. Can I, can I also say something con controversial in that regard? Um, uh, Stephen Jones and myself um, were uh, involved in the Chevron matter that was five weeks in the federal court late last year in a transfer pricing dispute, um, well documented and well discussed, um, judgment reserved. Um, in that five weeks, however, in terms of um, winning a transfer pricing dispute, um, whether the commissioner or whether the taxpayer, the documentation that was put in place does not count for a whole lot in the courtroom, to be frank. Um, it's important from an ATO perspective and it's important particularly under the new transfer pricing provisions in terms of reasonably arguable position and management of penalties on an issue. But what wins a transfer pricing dispute at the end of the day is forensic, evidential, admissible evidence um, and expert evidence from qualified people. So uh, in terms of glossy development of paperwork and documentation and whether it's done by a big four firm, <coughs> done by a boutique or done in-house, important for certain objectives but frankly not so important in the courtroom at the end of the day. Um, sorry, can I just ask a question as well? Um, just with the change in focus on particular transactions, I know Dale said that corporates understand their business and their transactions and pricing. And they're in the best position to understand that. But just I'm interested in finding out how the ATO goes about sort of not just getting benchmarks for prices but also for commercial and financial relations and structuring and how does it sort of what does it rely on because there is a bit of a change in focus. I understand it includes a transaction but it's broader than that so I'm just curious to see how that happens. So I think there's a, a bit of guidance in the in the ruling 2014-8 in terms of documentation as to um, what the commercial or financial relations, what we, we would be looking to see. So things that I mentioned before about um, corporate plan strategies, organisational chart, uh, the functions, assets, risks. Um, I think the ATO will always approach things from a functions, assets, risk perspective to start off with. So, you know, what are the functions of the entity? What are its assets and what are its risks? That's always a starting point. And, you know, we will often, if we're in an audit, we will seek to pull that picture together ourselves, um, sort of building on, on what Chris was saying. The documentation's there. But if, if we think that there is an issue with what's in the documentation that it may not accurately reflect what's actually happening on the ground, we will sort of push that to a side and say, well, we're going to go do our own functions, assets, risks. We'll go out, we'll interview people, uh, we'll talk to people on the ground, uh, functional heads of each of your units, your business units, we'll go out, we'll talk to them, we'll try to get a better understanding of what's actually happening. In a lot of cases, we've um, you know, accessed emails of those people just to try to get that day-to-day -day what's happening actually on the ground. 
trying to build together our own functions, assets, risk picture. And then it's the totality of the dealing. So you'll also see a focus from the ATO on pulling together that broader value chain picture. Um, we may have been, you know, a few years ago, we may have focused on the Australian entity and just what it does. I think there's definitely a push now to get that broader holistic picture of what are the entities offshore? What are the Australian party, Australian entities, related parties? Where do they sit in the value chain and what do they contribute to the value chain? Because ultimately, you can only really assess the profits that the Australian entity should earn by working out that entire value chain. So there is that broader analysis as well that we'll be undertaking. So a couple of minutes. Um, I will just add one more point on documentation in relation to Australian subsidiaries of uh, foreign multinationals. Again, it's drawn from um, an example that we've seen. Uh, so sometimes uh, the Australian subsidiary may use uh, a parent's global policies for transfer pricing as their own uh, documentation. Again, that, that's fine, but care needs to be taken to ensure that it's fit for purpose. So one example we saw was um, uh, Australian transfer pricing documentation was, was prepared. Um, and that was then replaced with the parents' global documentation. Um, but the Australian documentation which was prepared, uh, the services that the Australian entity was doing were uh, at cost plus 8%, and the parents' do global documentation was cost plus 5%. So the cost plus 5 just pretty much overtook the cost plus 8 with really no explanation. So again, you need to make sure that the documentation that's being prepared on which you're lodging your tax return is appropriate for your circumstances. There is a case study which I'm just going to skip. If you have any questions, please ask me. <laughs> <laughs> um, again, in, in terms of using transfer pricing as an example, um, you know, it's a key element of interna international tax risk, but it's by no means the only thing the ATO will look at. Um, as I said, we are moving at obtaining a, a more broader look at your value chain, uh, an acknowledgement that a one-sided approach is not appropriate. Um, so we will understand the global value chain and try to obtain all the agreements that underpin that, uh, and we'll have a broader we'll have a broader look at um, all the international tax risks, which may include, you know, residency source, permanent establishment, uh, thin capitalisation. Um, again, however, transfer pricing document documentation will often be the uh, first bit of documentation that the ATO will request in a review, um, and as highlighted, inadequate or non-existent documentation uh, may result in an audit. Um, we'll seek to gain a complete understanding of the business and business models and not just isolated transactions. We'll speak to people who run the business, so not the tax people, and once we understand what the actual business is, we'll be able to, able to determine if the documentation is appropriate. Sandra, can I just, sorry, can I just point out, uh, Michael has generally donated five minutes of his consolidations time, so if you did want to go through that case study on international, okay. if that was no, important, if you, if you can do it in five minutes, all right. um, it's a bit like Michael. Michael. <clears throat> international oh, okay. is a bit all like right. Marsha, okay. Marsha, 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 Marsha. Consolidation is a bit like Jan Brady. So it's, like <laughs> 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 so. it's not very long anyway, the case study. Um, so it's just an example. I mean, I've tried to draw out other examples that I've seen in my work, but here's just an example. Um, so, yeah, Australian subsidiary of a large global multinational operating in the oil and gas extraction industry. Uh, entity was selected for a review due to the size and nature of their international later party dealings, together with their poor long-term profit, uh, profit and tax performance. So the IDS in this particular scenario would have shown uh, large royalty payments going offshore and payments for services or technical services going offshore as well. At the review stage, taxpayer could not provide adequate documentation explaining the commerciality of the outcomes. Uh, so this means the review would move into an audit where we'd have a closer and more comprehensive analysis of the transaction in question. So one of the specific issues that was considered in, in this case was access to a technical database which the Australian company was uh, paying a related party offshore to access. Uh, the access was costed by inquiry type and the database was held in a low tax jurisdiction. Um, global engineers, including Australian engineers, contributed to the database for no reward uh, and the actual pricing allocation keys uh, were considered a, a poor match for the fact pattern. Uh, so obviously the area of concern is that the Australian company is paying more to access the database than it should. Um, and that uh, Australian engineers who contribute to the database are not being remunerated appropriately. Um, I suppose the key point of the case study is obviously there's technical issues there that need to be dealt with, but it can be difficult for both the ATO and the taxpayer 
to actually identify comparable transactions and arrangements when evaluating whether the arm's length principle has been complied with. Um, it's probably very difficult, nigh on impossible, to, to find a, an exact comparable in the open market. Um, in my experience, the ATO will take a flexible and reasonable approach to, to these sorts of issues, um, but acknowledging that an outcome has to be reached. Um, we may engage uh, external experts and we'll definitely engage our internal experts who are usually our economist practice to assist us in formulating what the arm's length outcome should be. Um, and we will definitely have discussions with taxpayers should we disagree with the, what they consider to be the arm's length outcome. Any questions on the case study? Does the tax office um, engage with the other jurisdictions, revenue authorities, once it's, if at all, or, or once it's undertaking a transfer pricing review? Uh, it, it would depend on the circumstances. So in some of the cases that, that we have been working um, working on, uh, there is a, a very broad uh, sort of global value chain at play. Um, to the extent the Australian entity is unable to give us the uh, documents or information which we require to better understand that value chain, then we will definitely use our exchange of information powers with other jurisdictions to obtain some of that information. Um, so it definitely does happen. Uh, so just going back to uh, transfer pricing as an example, um, as I mentioned earlier, in some of the cases we've seen, the, um, the documentation actually bears little resemblance to what's actually been done on the ground. Um, you know, business and businesses and business models you know, evolve over time and often the documentation doesn't keep up with that. So we will interview people, sometimes even at the review stage. Um, just going on one of, one of Kate's points, we, you know, we had a review of uh, you know, a routine distributor who had a nice horse package, TP documentation prepared by a big four. Uh, but when we actually um, drilled down into what's actually happening in the business, it became apparent that that documentation had not kept up with changes in the business. Uh, you could see direct consumer sales teams, you could see uh, technical engineers, you could see extensive services to partners, and none of that was in the transfer pricing documentation at all. So it's definitely critical that the business itself contributes to the formulation of the transfer pricing documentation, because you're the one that knows what's happening. I think that's a really important issue from a couple of perspectives that we've certainly seen that um, can have really adverse impacts, is quite apart from the fact that the information undermines the, the company's story in terms of the actual facts, um, but it also undermines the ATO's confidence in the, in the processes and the attention to detail within the company, which then can heighten the risk perception going forward and I think that's a pretty, it's not just about yeah, the actual agree. documentation. Yeah, it goes to what processes do you have in place to ensure that that documentation accurately reflects what's actually happening. So uh, often, you know, we'll see that when, it, when, when the pricing is set when a transaction is entered into, it, it's, it's fine and it's probably okay, but as you move year to year, there does need to be a process in place in your company to ensure that that documentation is reviewed whether it's on a yearly basis or even more currently, if, you know, more frequently, if you think that the changes uh, happen quite regularly, yes, it does need to be reviewed. And that goes to the governance about making sure that it's not just a rehash of the same documentation uh, every single year. And but, so but it also impacts the... Um it impacts the, the ability of the company to give the ATO the level, level of comfort yep. that the ATO needs, and, yes. it, and it just keeps... Under, you know, it's another way of undermining the company's position because the ATO will feel that it has to test everything. Yes. Yep. Um, in other cases, we've seen that uh, uh, the pricing itself, so what you might consider the arm's length pricing is, is commercial, but the structuring of the particular transaction is not. Um, so aggressive or complex stru structuring will also uh, attract our attention. Um, so again, you'll expect questions from the ATO which are broader than just, you know, is the interest rate appropriate or just pure pricing questions. Um, you know, in one case we've seen, uh, you know, a particular transaction which involved um, some loans and cross-currency interest rate swaps. If you were to look at the loans and the swaps in isolation, they were priced appropriately, but the question then became, 
the structuring of those particular instruments through limited liability partnerships. So often we'll get, but the transfer pricing is okay, why are you looking at this? As I said, transfer pricing is one part, but it's, it's not the only thing that we will look at. Um, in summary. <laughs> <laughs> So the ATO has a strong focus on international tax risks, broader than just transfer pricing risks. Uh, entities need to consider the appropriateness of their transfer pricing documentation and ensure it's up to date. And tax managers need to consider whether the documentation accurately summarises the related party dealings and provides a necessary assurance that they're priced using the arm's length principle. ATO believes most taxpayers want to do the right thing and will engage in open and transparent discussions with you regarding international tax risks. We'll always seek to maintain collaborative relationships with taxpayers, but that does not always mean we will agree with you. In these situations, we'll explain our views to you and what we're thinking and give you an opportunity to respond. And I just want to end on uh, the ATO does have a robust APA program, which taxpayers can avail themselves of for practical certainty. Um, oh, I'd heard that um, it's an APA that had been entered into quite some time ago for some organisations being unwound by the ATO as a result of an audit. Could that possibly happen? So an APA is, it's a, in a sense, it's similar to a, a ruling. It's based on the facts that you give the ATO and it'll, built within the APA will be uh, what we call critical assumptions. Um, so uh, expectations of sort of, you know, obviously the thing with, a, with an APA is it's signed at day one and it may apply, apply for five years. So right. built within that is, you know, if there's uh, new businesses, if there's considerable growth in revenue, if there are changes, then the, the ATO will seek to review the applicability of the APA because it's a go forward thing. I mean, we're not, we can't tell the future. Yeah. So there will be scenarios where things change and that APA, which was appropriate at day one, is not appropriate at, at year two. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Sandra. Um, well, we're now going to hear, spend 30 minutes on GST. And Steve, I understand you're, you're back to the lectern yep. for this one. Um, and I'll be calling on Stephen Jones to ask Stephen Howland, too many Stephens, <coughs> lots of questions. Um, on the subject of questions, could I just um, reach out to the WebEx participants? I've yet to see a question from the WebEx participants, and I want to see. Um, our, our organisers tell me I would get a question on this iPad. I want to see the technology working. Um, so if I could encourage you to ask a question just to prove to me that what they tell me this technology does, does in fact do that. So You're all uh, waiting for the consolidation there's, session. There's, a, there's 170 of you, so you outnumber the people in the room. Um, and if they're waiting for Michael's session, that's fine. So over to you, Stephen. OK, thank you. I'll most probably take 20, 25. Uh, minutes because I want to make sure you all get away on time so I won't go the full half hour. Um, okay so um, during the break many people asked me what was the source of those fantastic jokes. <laughs> uh, risk mitigation associates, if you go to their website you'll see the one where they calculate the return on uh, risk uh, the investment and the actuaries blog. Okay so if you want to get the, to the source of those scintillating stories. Um, can I just Try one more on you, because this is this this always works, right? So if it doesn't work, it's not me, okay? So one last joke, right? I'll try. Is that I, t I spoke to you before about the ATO reinventing itself, um, you know, and um, being client focused, whatever. Um, people in the past have been a bit fearful of the ATO, you know, de um, depending on the, the circumstances, and so. Um, and, and, and people have um, sort of um, maybe not had goodwill towards the ATO. So I'll tell you a story uh, about a lady who needed a new heart. Have you heard this? Has anyone heard this? No? Okay, I've not seen any recognition here. A lady needed a new heart and her surgeon rang her one day and said, it's your lucky day, but unfortunately for two people, it's not their lucky day. There's been a serious car accident. Two people have died. There's a man and there's a woman. You have a choice of the hearts. I'm going to t describe the, the, the people to you. So one heart belongs to, belonged to a lady who was an athlete, 25 years old, fantastic condition, looked after herself, absolutely amazing. Uh, the second heart belonged to a tax man, 45, 50 years old, Okay, most probably drunk a bit too much, smoked a lot, overate, he's very obese. This is not um, 
This is not autobiographical, by the way. <laughs> so, and he says that he may have taken drugs in his younger years. And so he said, the surgeon says, which heart would you choose? And she says, I'll take the tax man's heart. And he says, why would you choose that heart? He says, because it's never been used. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, third time lucky, Steve. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Third time lucky. Right, good one. Tell your friends that one. Okay, that's not an actuarial joke. This is the sort of jokes that we tell around the barbecue, us tax people, you know? So we're uh, obviously better than actu actuarial. So look, um, I've got to focus on um, um, GST for a little while. So you can ask me anything about GST. Okay, and if I don't know it, um, my brother will know the answer. Unfortunately, he's not here. Um, but, um, okay, here we are. So just to focus on large corporates um, for, for a little while, think about large end of town. Um, we aim to achieve uh, what we call real-time engagement and future compliance through that real-time engagement. And I'll come back to that tax governance and risk management focus that I talked about a bit earlier. And what does that mean in the GST world? Um, because the GST world's a lot about crunching numbers, uh, you know, the GST on supplies, the GST on acquisitions, making sure that, you know, the, the information is captured, originated, captured, stored, and reported, basically, is the whole woe to go sort of process that you have to manage as businesses. And they can substantial numbers, you know, I mean, we're talking millions and if not billions of transactions um, that occur each year that you and your businesses manage uh, and, and put on those returns. So what's really important from a GST perspective <coughs> and where we've seen the, there might be problems is, is in the use of the multiple systems or systems integration. I'll talk more about that and uh, perhaps give you an example. Failure to implement processes and procedures. So, like I said before, you can have a whiz-bang guidelines and processes, but, you know, the implementation is really the important part. And also, as well, the risk of manual interventions um, is also uh, an area that um, I would advise you to focus on. So, we call it integrity of business systems. Some people actually uh, call that IBS, okay? But uh, if I say IBS, I, I mean integrity of business systems. And that's about that whole process of capturing, originating information to reporting information. So, very significant risk uh, in, the, in the GST world. Uh, what was, the, I think, uh, last year, about 300 million, I think, were the adjustments that were made in relation to, um, to this particular risk. Um, it's a big number. Uh, but uh, as well as the, also the, you know, we do collect 56 billion, um, where, which comes through the door without intervention. But there's another 300 million that we've, we've collected uh, in addition to, uh, to uh, what's been reported in relation to these errors that could occur. And it tends to be at the large end of town as well, um, where we notice that, those errors. Um, majority of ATO judgments um, could have been avoided um, if there had been a more robust tax risk management process in place. So the common errors are activity state preparation, 30%, system related issues, 23%, uh, and also as well characterization or uncertainty about the nature of the supply is uh, 18%. So ask yourselves, you know, do you have uh, a robust enough system to make sure that the GST you're reporting is correct? Um, are you finding, you know, some of the indicators um, that uh, you might need to do a bit more work is that um, if you're finding errors, that the same error keeps occurring and occurring and occurring. Um, I think you also, this is a double-edged sword, this, is that if you're not finding any errors, that's most probably a worry too. Um, so um, I know they sound contradictory, but, you know, they're the two extremes of, of and some, most of you will lie somewhere in between and make an error now and again. Okay, and hopefully, if you do make the error, you've got the processes and systems or reports to actually capture the error. So they are thinking about exception reports or variation reports or trend analysis that might help you uh, identify after the fact that you've actually made an error. Now, fortunately, those variance analysis or whatever require on, you know, they only pick up the bigger, bigger type of errors. Um, but... Yeah, sorry, Chris. Sorry, um, Steve, having called for questions on Webex, I'm now getting them coming through. Oh, great. And I'm going to go through <laughs> these. Um, 
Um, and there's some good news in this. So Donna says the session so far has been great, which is excellent. So I'm going to say that one's answered and hopefully it goes away. Greg said, you're going to like this one, Stephen. Greg says these webcasts are extremely useful and informative, even the jokes. Really? Somebody likes your Thanks, jokes. Thanks, Greg. Um, Appreciate that. Um, but Heather, they've asked if they, they could start a little later for those of us in the West. So um, just a point to note there. Uh, we've been, you've been asked a question here. This question continues from an earlier point by one of your panel members. We are a top 100 company but have a low risk rating for GST. So we've lost our GST relationship manager. We don't know how to ask GST technical questions of the ATO. Can the ATO provide some guidance in this regard? Okay. So, um, again, a apparent contradiction there, isn't there? Success, which was <laughs> sorting out your risk meant you lost your client relationship manager. You could, from the ATO's perspective, you could see why that would happen because we've said, oh, you're really light touch now. You know, you've proved to us that you, you, you know, you're uh, low risk and therefore will be even lighter touch. The downside of that is they've lost a bit of a connection. And that may have been why they actually, um, have, may have helped them actually reach a position where we could walk away. So um, there's no easy answer to this, right? And so the, the fundamental of the question is that this taxpayer is now in a good position in a sense that they are low risk. That, that's, that's a great place to be. Um, the connection with us has been lost. Um, the best I could suggest in this particular circumstance is that they do try and reconnect with the client relationship manager. But appreciate, though, that that client relationship manager has most probably been assigned to someone else who needs help more than them. So there's no ideal answer. If, they doesn't, if that doesn't work, if they can't reconnect um, uh, with that particular client relationship manager, then uh, you know, they'd have to go through the normal process of um, connecting with the ATO, asking for private binding rulings, etc., or advice. Um, Nigel uh, Cousins here. Um, Steve, there, um, for Look, for taxpayers that have been rated lower risk, there is an area that's been set up um, in the uh, uh, between GST or indirect tax and um, PGI called the large service teams. So they look after the, um, the, the admin sort of areas and they should be able to assist progressing rulings and that, okay. that sort of thing. So, look, I, I don't know their number offhand. Um, but I do know that they're available what's to, the, what's to the assist. Name of that group? Large service teams. Large service teams. So what we'll do, um, if we could provide the organisers with that contact number, I think that would most probably. I mean, <coughs> if if you are going to communicate afterwards, you could communicate that. Okay. <coughs> thanks, yeah. thanks, Nigel. All right. Uh, just at that point, any other questions of what I've said so far? Anyone? Can you? Okay. Sorry, one, one related point in, uh, on communications and, and ability of the taxpayer. So if you've got the top end of town who've got a client relationship um, yeah. manager, it's pretty easy. You've got, you pick up the phone and you've got a direct line into you know, levels of competency in the tax office to answer your serious questions. But you've got a whole layer of uh, taxpayers out there who large have significant transactions, but yeah. they don't have that ability. No. And... Um, um, I think that's a concern with GST. I, I had a client um, last year, for example, had a large contra transaction, and you know we were talking about fifty to eighty million dollars, yeah. and there was a timing issue because um, uh, there were basically progressive supplies on one side, so there's attribution at one point in time, but you couldn't work out until you got to the end what the total um, uh, contribution was for the other supply coming the other way. And we applied for a ruling for the Commissioner to um, you know, uh, get the Commissioner to exercise his discretion uh, in relation to the attribution. Uh, I left that firm and it's been left with um, <laughs> the, 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 my, the, my past firm, but um, there's something like six months had gone past and had been allocated to a junior officer who said, this is incredibly complex and it was a really simple matter. And I think that's something that the tax office needs to address, that you get you know, rulings or, or you know, applications like that, which are critical to, yeah. um, to a business. Uh, because you're stuck you had a, at a client who was stuck with the position where, strictly speaking, they've got attribution on day one because there's been consideration yeah. provided, but you're not going to know till the end of the year what the actual total consideration would be, so what do they put in their bags? Yeah. 
Yeah. So it's a, a, a fair point. I mean, the, what I take away from that is that whilst we do look at after the biggest taxpayers for good reason, in the sense that they have client relationship managers, because something like 48% of the tax is collected from the top 2% in terms of, uh, of companies. So, you know, you can see why we actually invest at the uh, top end of town, but we also do a lot of work with the other 2.6 million or whatever taxpayers as well. There's a lot of them. Um, so some taxpayers will from time to time have large transactions um, that are significant. That's, that's what I'm hearing uh, and uh, we, you know, we don't have, uh, that I'm aware of, uh, a process for, other than the normal private binding ruling process. Okay? So um, you know, the facility is there and regrettably it took a long time by the sounds of it in, in this occasion. One of the things that we're trying to do, I'll come to you in a sec, yes, Carmen. Um, one of the things that we're trying to do um, with our advice people uh, and even our objections people as well is that asking them to pick up the phone in the first instance and speak to the taxpayer when they receive a request for advice or an objection and that's really about I'm trying to unfold the taxpayer story I, why is this important to you, what is important to you, what are your expectations so the, but there will be occasions when delays do occur and I think that we just need to look harder at ourselves in order to uh, make sure um, that we don't have those sort of delays. Come on. Just, uh, I think there are also other mechanisms for um, taxpayers in that smaller group to go th through those who do have, you know, can connect them with the ATO. Yeah. And in, in our experience, um, where we do, where, you know, someone does have an issue um, and it may need to be discussed with the ATO initially, then um, in our experience, the ATO does put together resources, even if it's not a client service manager, yeah. um, someone who have the necessary expertise to sit down and have a discussion. So there are those, those informal ways, and I think in, in a lot of respects, that's the, you know, that's the sort of engagement that should be occurring. Yeah. Obviously, resources um, permitting, but I've found that the ATO is... Um, more than receptive to, um, you know, having someone assigned to look at a matter, if you know, if that connection is made. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yes. Just on the large service terminals and mailbox, it's actually set up specific for the specific for large taxpayers. So I'll we'll supply that at the end of the at the end of the session. Okay. Large. Right. Okay. Um, just moving on. Here's um, this is a case study, by the way. Right. This is a. a my Apple Mac uh, electrical system by the looks of it. Um, it's actually, what it actually shows is a, an operational and transactional system across the top. There's three entities here. Uh, and then down below that, that operational and transactional system might be a point of sale system, say, then feeds into the enterprise resource planning system uh, from which then there's consolidation for the group return uh, right at the bottom for that particular group of enterprises. Um, you know, it looks complex, it's fairly straightforward, you're talking about filtering into uh, uh, an aggregate system. Um, but the point, the example that I've got was where this actually went wrong. So we actually looked at the enterprise resource planning uh, and saw good governance around that. And we saw good governance around operational and transactional systems as well at the top. The only problem was is that the two didn't link properly. Um, so, you know, you can work, I guess the message is that you can work very hard on any one particular part of the system, but it's the linkages between the system um, that are important. Um, there's another example here, and all this diagram shows is that um, <coughs> this particular taxpayer that's uh, referred to here had everything in place, procedures, adequate training, staff responsibilities, robust tax coding. Uh, treatment of unusual transactions was also in place and also independent review. So they had the whole shooting match to actually make sure the returns were correct. Uh, and yet there was a human element in there that allowed discretion uh, and it was around the coding. Uh, it was a financial services provider uh, and as a consequence some of its supply, it wasn't, wasn't yourself. Um, <laughs> it was, uh, it wasn't. <laughs> Um, it's financial services provider, complexity around input taxation, which basically means some input tax credits they can claim and some they can't, depending on the types of supplies that they make. 
Now, cut a long story short, any business that makes two types of supplies, input tax and taxable, has to apportion. They have to relate sales to purchases or activity to purchases to work out how much input tax credits they can claim. This particular taxpayer um, uh, did the coding, so, but they coded some of their, they stepped outside their natural systems and said those purchases over there relate to those sales over there. Um, and it, you know, it was a coding error um, uh, that, uh, that um, caused the problem. So again, people are important, even if you build the, the systems, is how people operate, whether they do it deliberately in, uh, in operation or by accident in, uh, in, in operation. So um, other examples as well we've seen of uh, overclaims resulting from uh, um, use of input tax credit estimators that have not been periodically reviewed and changes have occurred. Um, I'm coming towards the end now. What do I do? Stephen, I'm getting a few more. Uh, our, our WebEx friends have become quite active, which is great. Um, uh, I think these are more comments than uh, questions, but I might just... Sure. Let, uh, so, uh, <clears throat> so someone said, we are in a similar position where we no longer have a relationship manager. We now email the large service team, whatever that is, with queries, and they have been a great help. We have noticed a slower response time, though. So don't expect a quick turnaround. Allow 28 days before getting answers in some cases. Um, and then there's a, there's a large service team at ato.gov.au. Is that? Yeah, that's, uh, what, is that what, the one so you were, Nigel yep. was referring to. So well, that's that, good that uh, they're making contact. Yes. Um, then we've got another one. Uh, just a comment on the contra. Some CTA members last week, me included, met with the ATO and the attribution issue is currently being addressed by the Safe Harbours Steering Group. One outcome that is being considered is that parties to the transaction will enter into an agreement that the parties agree that the values are equal. Okay, this is due which, to contra transactions? Yeah. Um, yeah, okay. Which will serve as a tax invoice so that you don't have the timing problem. We are somewhat optimistic that the ATO are keen to address this problem administratively. Still some time to pass though. Yeah, so there was a meeting last week with, yep. a, with, a, number of, um, with a number of parties, um, business, and, um, yeah, business and tax managers. Um, so, and that was looking at safe harbours around what they call the barter transactions. Uh, and uh, again, it's like the person says, you know, it's about um, how do you value it and what documents might need to be exchanged, etc. So, um, yeah. Look, we, and, and we've put it under the safe harbour category as well. There's a number of areas of safe harbour. We're looking at um, um, some safe harbours around financial institutions, uh, not the bigger ones, the, the smaller end of town, uh, and around about portionment. Um, but and, uh, and that's part of the reinventing the ATO uh, and the and the desire to actually try and remove some of the burdens that uh, that might be in the system and make it a bit easier for people to comply. Well, I would say that about um, financial acquisitions threshold. Yeah. We're not a financial institution, but yeah. we've had a few of them apply to us. And I, uh, as a personal comment, I just find it ridiculous that you know this, the complexity that is in the financial services system would be attracted to my organisation, which is a health organisation. Yeah. That, that's just a personal comment on Okay. That so how, how does the financial acquisition threshold... If there's a share sale. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But it, it, you, you, you'd normally be outside of the system yes. because of the threshold. That's correct. So, but it's not something I wouldn't deal with fat on a normal day, yeah. you know, on a daily basis. No, and then no. all of a sudden it's something that, you know, that I have to, that I have to deal with. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, um, I better be. I'm conscious of the time, and I'm also conscious that my thing's not working here, and it's not turning over the um, the slides. So have I got it the wrong way around, or what? Just no, before you so. just before you move on, Stephen, I'm conscious huh? we haven't heard from uh, our friends at um, Westpac or Woolworths in relation to GST. So yeah. I'm, I'm throwing it to the three of you. Are there any comments on what Stephen said? Yeah, on? I've actually been a little bit absorbed by the comments from, firstly from Stephen in terms of just the, the engagement model. Um, look, being being Westpac and being a large taxpayer and a key taxpayer, for us it is all about that relationship and the engagement with the tax office. So 
Um, I would strongly encourage Steve, and Steve knows I've said this to the, uh, the tax office many times, it is about the engagement model. It is about the tax office creating uh, the foothold that taxpayers at all levels can step into and engage with them. Um, and if that means that you're engaging automatically because you're, al you're allowed to, to correct your own errors or lodge, you know, as, as Nigel pointed out, just put in information in the tax office because if you're low risk, all they just want to know is that you're doing something. So I think there's a, there's a bit of a, a lesson or, or something to, that we can probably take forward uh, in terms of the engagement model being critical at all levels, yeah. not just the big end of town. Yeah. Yeah, the challenge there is the number of people we have that can engage, you know, so, um, but look, yeah. you know, we've, we have looked at, um, you know, going further down the market and extending the relationship model. Mm. Um, but again, um, you know, resources becomes the... Yeah, yeah I think, um, the issue. you know, one of, the, one of the things you can get if you are a, a taxpayer, at one end of the spectrum, you can do effectively access the portal and adjust... Uh, your GST errors, etc., yeah. automatically. I mean, technology is the solution there. Yeah. It's not throwing people at it. Yeah. It's about what sort of engagement model you have for a small taxpayer who doesn't have the need to have a full-time client relationship yeah. person, but just requires an ability to communicate something to the yeah. tax office. And there's been quite a bit of an investment as well, led by the reinvention process, about trying to make those portals a bit more easier yeah. to use. You know. Um, given the functionality where taxpayers can see their past records, etc. Yeah. So um, these are ongoing improvements that have been given a bit more of uh, impetus by the reinvention process. So that's that's good. And, you know, that, I mean, that's not face-to-face -face engagement, but it's effective engagement, isn't it? That's right. Yeah. It's all about the service that the tax office can yeah. deliver using different mechanisms. Yeah, yeah, no, I, yeah. Yeah, I guess, Chris, um, we come from a privileged, if that's the right word, position where we um, deal extensively with the ATO and GST matters, um, not least of which is because we have to have discussions about whether a pizza roll is actually a pizza or it's a bread roll, um, and wherefore does it attract GST. So we have a whole series of quite regular discussions around those issues, yeah. and we don't always have agreement on those particular points, but that's, that's part of the process. Um, but certainly... Um, you know, we, we also apply for lots of rulings um, for, on a whole range of things. So um, our engagement is quite extensive. That's so, good. and from my point of view, it's, it's quite good. So there's actually not a lot, yeah. to, from my perspective, to be critical of. But I, I can understand that um, yeah. if you're not large, then yeah, the, the access is, is a bit of an issue. Yeah. So the um, the pizza rolls even got a, a mention, I think, in the uh, discussion paper that was issued. Yes. I seem to recall. Yeah. The, um, we could so have a few other just... products in there, Steve, but we haven't got time. That's time. right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's a bit of an esoteric sort of um, discussion, isn't it? The um, um, I just uh, one last thing I'll mention is, um, you know, you can automate. Um, your systems, and that, that's really good. That's, that's the way to go. Uh, you know, it's efficient and effective and, and accurate uh, most of the time. Um, we do have an area where we see problems, which is around manual journal entries. Okay? As an old auditor, or an auditor of old, um, uh, is that it used to be one of the areas I, when I worked in the UK Customs and Excise on VAT, this was the area we always went to. When you went to a, a, a corporate, you'd, you'd, you'd go straight to the manual journal entries because that's where people are making choices and decisions. Uh, and it's easy to make the wrong choice and decision if you're not very well trained. Um, so um, we do find errors typically around manual journals. You know, input tax credits claimed on things that are not taxable, that had they gone through the normal accounts payable system, someone who's familiar with it would have known that there was no tax on it. So, um, and even GST over accounted for as well on, on journals as well. So it works both ways. Um, so just, just be aware of that. Oh, and then Steve, the only thing I would add there is, you know, manual journals are, are the worst kind of <coughs> error you can have. But in, in, in a strange way, if you have no systems, your, your risk is pretty big because you've got lots of manual journals to look at. But if you've got fantastic automated systems, manual journals continue to be your biggest risk because they're the journals that people do because the system didn't work in the first place. So it is right that you call out 
manual journals. Um, anything you can do in a business, and I can tell you from experience, it doesn't matter how big you are, you can isolate manual journals using ERP systems if you choose to. So um, it is an area that's fairly actually easy to tackle if you've got the wherewithal. Okay, Thank, thanks Chris. Um, so, um, yeah, that's as much as I need to say on GST. If you've got any final questions before I sit down. Steve, can I just ask one yep. question? You made mention before about the new Commissioner's discretion, yep. which I think is a great development. Um, do you see in the GST space that you will, would make use of, of that? Um, yeah, I could see it, yeah. yeah. It's not going to fix everything, by the way. You know, I don't think there's, you know, it's going to, I, I don't, you know, I don't know how often it's going to be used, but I just know that it, it, it can't fix everything. But it will fix the, you know, the, the example that they quote was where people in Queensland who lived near the river had to relocate up the hill uh, and they had to sell their property and buy a new one. And yet the business investors were caught by CGT uh, because of that change. And yet really there was no change for them in, in a sense. Um, but, and so the, maybe the new rules would operate in that circumstance to say, yeah, okay, the CGT would apply, but really policy-wise, we don't want to collect tax on this event. So, you know, I could, um, I'm struggling to think of an example in GST, um, but um, I'm sure I'll think of one before we finish today. So, um, yeah. Right, thank you very much, okay. Stephen. We're now coming to the Jan Brady session. Um, <laughs> if I could encourage our... Um, our audience and our WebEx participants in particular to keep um, questions coming through. We all know Jan grew up with a complex and we don't want Michael to suffer from that as well. Okay. Yes, um, it's the most exciting session of the morning and I know your blood sugar levels must be dropping dramatically for lunch. So I'll try and keep the tempo up, given I've got even less time than I thought I had. So uh, there may or may not be a quick quiz at the end of this to see if you're actually listening. Um, happy to take questions. Like I said, for those that I can't answer, I'll take them on notice, or my colleagues on my left can answer them for you. So good morning. Some of you may know me. Um, I'm Michael Dragaris. I'm currently in the private group space of the ATO. Um, recently moved across the last six months to help the private group space with their tax governance and their technical issues. So I've formerly before that, as I mentioned, I was in the banking space and in the former LBNI, currently PGI space for about seven or eight years. So I've had extensive knowledge around tax governance and implemented a vast array of traditional products around you know, pre-logical compliance reviews and assisted with annual compliance arrangements. So hence those, some of the comments this morning. Um, now I realise this, this morning has been information filled and you know, you're all about to, to spill over in your cups because you've had so much information, but um, consolidation is a very large topic and I don't plan on discussing um, things that are interaction issues. Uh, I know many of you may be disappointed to not talk about thin cap and consolidation and arm's length capital amounts and other things, but there's not enough time in, in this session to talk about it. So what I plan to do is just, just canvas and highlight some of the, some of the issues that we commonly see uh, around calculation of the ACA, etc. And the things on the slide, so the deductions. Um, I'll give you an example around MEX where it just might be a conversation starter. Um, some things we look around reporting and, uh, and obligations, which you know, if, if you have a strong governance process in place, you can get that information to us so we can rely upon that as well. And then the good old chestnut uh, part 4A. Um, so, uh, as so a foundation cornerstone of the consolidation regime is that upon formation or entry, the tax cost of each asset of a joining subsidiary is based on a share of the allocable cost amount of that subsidiary, or the ACA. The ACA consists of the cost of the membership interest in the entity as well as the liabilities which become assumed liabilities of the group, the head company. The ACA calculation process includes various other adjustments which we won't go through today, but also it's an ACA process, some of which are under review and we will look at shortly. I'm sure there's some comments there. As a reference point though, the ATO will use the consolidation notification form, hence why it's very important for you to actually lodge that when the changes occur, uh, to identify the entities that enter and leave the group. Now, the ATO will also look at information including documents lodged with ASIC, so we're looking at other external information that's available to us, that's publicly available. Um, 
company financial reports and media releases to identify whether there has or should have been an entry into or an exit from a tax consolidated group. Now, I know there's been some comments about reliance on media releases, but it's not like we just sit there read the paper and say that's the absolute truth because we all know that you know, certain things are written in a certain way. So it's just an indicator. So it's just another piece of information that if we don't have something, we can look at that. And as Steve mentioned and the panellists have mentioned, we pick up the phone and ask some questions. In the PGH world, we're doing a lot of that now. So in the private group and high wealth individual space or wealthy groups, we pick up the phone and we ask if we see something. Instead of sending out something for review and so we're going to ask a few questions and go through you know, the, the routine process of a legacy product, we're starting to move away from that in the private group space very much so, and looking at just picking up the phone and going visiting, you know, with notice, of course, and just asking a couple of questions. And if they are, our concerns are mitigated, that's it. That'll be the end of it, rather than going through an arduous process of a review. Now, I acknowledge that the ACA calculations are undertaken on entities joining or leaving a group. Today's focus will be on some entry issues, just again, because we're limited for time. As the entry process involves calculating the ACA, uh, then using the ACA to set the cost of assets to join a group, the ACA re reviews whether they are in the pre-lodgement space or traditional legacy, will seek to confirm that the ACA calculation is not overstated. Okay? Uh, as far as the ACA calculation process is concerned, we've seen a number of calculations where items should have been added instead of subtracted and vice versa, being very general, but you can understand the point how that affects the actual out and ultimate outcome. We've also seen examples where steps have been double counted or not counted at all. So again, that really goes back to the governance process and your working papers and the data in your systems to make sure that it's accurate. Because it is a calculation. At the end of the day, it is a calculation. Now, we'll talk about market valuation shortly, and I'm sure there'll be a vast array of questions there. But when we talk about simple calculations, and I use the word simple very loosely, right, it, does, it is a matter of systems and processes and making sure that there are controls in place to actually verify those numbers if we ask any questions. Now, I would note, though, that this is an exception rather than the norm where we're seeing things being left out or double counted, but it's, just, it's good to highlight. Now, when we're looking at the individual steps of the entry ACA calculation, we usually turn our minds to what, we could, what is missing rather than what's actually there. Because what's there has obviously just been translated from your systems, but you know, missing could be from the very beginning. So if it's not actually put in your systems, then it's obviously not going to be counted at all anyway. Now, that could be to your benefit. It could be to the Australian government's benefit. So either way, we seek to correct and make sure that it's the correct calculation. Um, now, in that respect, again, not just tax return preparers, but anyone who has responsibility for those calculations in your, in your own team or whether you use an advisor to prepare that information should be very conscious of this. Um, now, we also turn our minds to whether joining entities' financial statements are consistent with accounting principles, given that obviously there is reliance on accounting principles to determine some steps of the ACA. Uh, we do note that many reviews, uh, again, whether that be in the real-time, contemporaneous, you know, pre-lodgement phase or legacy, could be a sort of space shortcutted if we actually had that information up front. So what we're suppose, encouraging in this space, and I suppose it's the same for international and ITX and any other risk, is come talk to us. You know, so before we actually get to that stage, and it's assuming it's a post-lodgement review, if you have concerns or misunderstandings or uncertainties, come and talk to us. I mean, that's a very important feature now. And I've, obviously, there's been a few comments around the level of resourcing we commit to service everybody, and that is a concern. And, you know, Steve's highlighted where that, you know, we do have some prioritisation that we have to do internally, but where we can, we will. And we have started doing that a lot in the PGH space. Now, this is, I suppose, goes back to that prevention before correction uh, mantra that we're putting out as well. Now, as an example, step one of the ACA calculation requires a capital gains tax cost base of the membership interests in the joining entity be used. So we would commonly inquire what process the taxpayers, or should say clients, have used to ensure all of the elements of the cost base are considered. Um, with some acquisitions, there's a risk that certain types of due diligence and associated costs are deducted as opposed to being added to be part of the cost base. So again, there's nothing new there, but it's, just, it's the relatively simple things that lead to much larger complex er errors. So just advising just to look back at the simple things in that calculation process and where they're appropriately attributed to. So another example might be the step two amount, the liabilities in the calculation. So we'll often look for evidence that the liabilities of the joining group upon joining are not overstated, again, because they're added to the calculation, that inflate the ACA, and then when they're actually allocated to the assets, then there'll be a higher cost base, so to speak, or tax cost setting amount than what is appropriate, the sort of true reflection of the economic cost of that particular asset. Now, working papers, obviously, there's nothing new here. 
Um, but having that information available, especially in the pre-lodgement space where you're getting close to actually lodging a return, it'd be useful for us and to have a discussion if you're thinking of doing things in a particular way which is potentially contrary to what there is out there as an ATO view. Um, deferred tax liability calculations, uh, again, that's something that's been up for review as well as part of the double counting issue, you know, both as deductible and added to the cost base. So again, having a look at those particular, I'm not an accountant myself, but um, those issues themselves are something to be aware of. Um, we've also observed instances where liabilities that do not exist for the joining entity but do for the joint group, now including the calculation. Now, again, that's the deferred tax liability. So just be conscious of that. So if we do see something or not see something, we will be asking questions about that. So again, come talk to us first if that's going to be a case where you think just by the calculation there will be questions asked by us. It just avoids the unnecessary compliance costs, so to speak, down the track. Okay. Now, although dot points two and three of the uh, slide can be discussed individually because there's obviously a clear link between the two, um, we acknowledge that the ACA is intended to allow the stepping up of reset cost-based assets. So obviously, you allocate the ACA to retain and reset. Um, but obviously, when there's you know some contrivance, blatant or otherwise, you know, or even just mistakes, we will be asking questions about that. So again, just an example. You know, there might be an allocation of the ACA. They might be conscious to move it to those assets where there is a particular tax benefit in doing so. So to those assets that have a depreciate that are, de that are depreciating and have you know, a revenue impact as well, not just a capital gains packing impact, capital gains tax impact, sorry. So again, the concern is that the, instead of the allocation being a refle fair reflection of the actual tax costs of the entity's assets, it is a skewing to assets that provide immediate benefits. So obviously we'll always be asking questions about that. Just, so. just a question there. Practically, yep. how do you see that often in the audits and the, the reviews that you're undertaking? Personally, I haven't, but there has been some concern as well. So we've highlighted it here because it's not a, an endemic problem, yep. but obviously where there is a benefit to be obtained, and it's, I suppose the, the, the proper way of saying it is that if there's a position you've taken that you think you can justify as being reasonably arguable in that respect, you know, and is in accordance with the law, come talk to us about it. Again, if, you're, if it's a position you're taking that you think is reasonable, or there's, you know, um, I think paragraph 43 of miscellaneous tax rule in 2002, if there's no, I suppose, relevant authority for allowed to do that, but you've got a well-reasoned construction yeah. to provide that wrap, then again, come talk to us about it. It's more about, like I said, preventing us coming in later on, so the an unnecessary compliance cost. But where there's simply you know, clear cut, there is a depreciating asset and you've allocated something more to it because, again, the next point is around market valuations, yep. more than what it should, then obviously there's an issue there yep. that we need to look at. Yep. So again, so it's obviously more pronounced where there's a pressure for the accounting treatment to be differing towards, the, diff, towards differing assets. Now, as we just mentioned, uh, you ensure that uh, you and your clients' uh, corporate tax governance framework provides internal controls. Very important that address the accuracy of the calculation. The governance framework should also provide processes through which the assurance can be sought for interpretational views, particularly, like I mentioned just then, where they may be contrary to our view, as in the ATO view. Now, I'm not saying that the ATO view is always going to be right. Things change. You know, views change. Court cases come out that probably needs to be updated occasionally. Okay? So, but again, where you believe you're taking a position, or a reasonable arguable position, that's contrary to an ATO view, come talk to us about it. Because it may be the case that the ATO ID, the ruling, etc., may need to be updated or may be wrong now because things have changed and moved on. So, again, another important point, obvious but needs to be stated, record keeping. So obviously you need records to highlight as evidence here. I did send, mention this is not the most exciting com uh, presentation. So, <laughs> <laughs> now, market valuations. Now, there will be questions, I'm sure. Now, important part of the tax cost setting process, obviously, because you allocated the reset cost based assets in accordance with their market value. So, this is what I mentioned as being one of those tools by which we can actually skew the actual allocation of the ACA. Now, the justification for market valuation approaches and the challenging them of, um, by the Commissioner may result in obviously substantial outlay of expenses on expert advice from both parties. Uh, the compliance costs associated with obtaining market valuations can be quite prohibitive. Um, obviously, we both don't want that. And the whole process can be subject to much dispute. 
So it has such a significant administrative impact that, uh, as my colleagues mentioned this morning, much attention has been placed on it in the academic profession. There's been IGOT reviews, there's been recommendations about how to change things. I suppose what we're looking at is that due to what could be prohibitive costs in market valuations that you come talk to us about your methodology that you wish to deploy. You look at what's available in terms of guidance that we've provided and issued on our websites. You, you know, talk to us if there's going to be, especially if they're internal valuations, not that I'm actually inferring that it's more risky than an external one, but just understand the methodology by which you came to that valuation. So again, we're very conscious of compliance costs and the reduction thereof. So we don't want to stifle you know, your commercial business by, you know, I suppose, the unnecessary costs associated with just complying with the law. So just, I suppose, be aware of that. And if you do have market valuation issues um, that you think may spark the attention or attract the attention of the ATO, that perhaps you come talk to us about that before you lodge your return. So that way we can discuss the matter and provide you a level of certainty that you require. And it may not be a private ruling. It may be some, some other method by which we can provide you the level of certainty that you require in order for you to lodge your returns that mitigates you know, the risk for both parties. Not eliminates, but it mitigates the risk from a compliance perspective. Can I ask you to pause there, Michael? Yep. Are there any questions from the panel of Michael of what he said so far on tax consolidation? I have a question for the panel. Good. Um, on tax consolidations and market valuations, I mean, it seems to me intuitively that if I was an in-house tax person and I've just bought a target company and I've got a va somebody's given me a valuation to of, of what the, sh the share value is, and I now have to do my ACA push-down allocation based on the relative market values of the underlying assets, m the natural um, instinct would be to go to the accounting people within the organisation and say, well, what are you going to book for accounting purposes? And that's what I'm going to use for tax purposes. So I'm interested from the panel if that's... Okay. Yeah. From my perspective, that's exactly what I do. So I always start with the accountants and say, well, what's your allocation? And often um, some of that value um, goes to intangibles, um, which may not have any tax relief other than a cost base issue for later on if sure. you ever sell it. Um, but that's always, for me, the starting point. And often the finishing point as well, um, unless there's a particular issue which, you know, there's an accounting reason why an allocation of value to a particular asset is the way it is, and you think, well, that's actually not reflecting, for the, you know, the, the accountants and the auditors might, might be indifferent to that allocation, but you might say, well, actually, that's not quite right from my perspective and we need to do something. But generally, I find it's pretty much in line. I agree. It's pretty hard to argue with a purchase price allocation that's been drafted by an independent organisation that the accountants are using and the auditors have said, yep, signed off. It's pretty hard to argue that that's not the market value. Yeah, the money comment, and this is a bit of an age-old issue, is about when you've got an agreement between two parties, often the contract might be silent as to allocation yeah. of value. True. Mm -hmm. and, and sometimes that might be because one party wants it that way or whatever, but yeah. anyway, that's what you're dealing with. Um, and so then it's up to each party to come up with um, what they think is the right answer. Mm. Yep. Um, now, I know in my experience, we've, we've often had queries from the tax office about wanting to understand how we've come to a value because the tax office is actually looking at the other side of the transaction um, and obviously trying to get some data from what we might have done. Um, but does that, that's got to be an issue that there's no easy answer to. There isn't, and I'm not an expert in the area, but like I mentioned before, it's situations like those that you're mentioning where it's easy to come talk to us prior to the lodging of the returns, so we're all aware. Now, a comment was made earlier in the piece that there will be times where we disagree, okay? The one thing I've always said is, I'm happy to disagree on the interpretation of the law to the facts, but not on the facts themselves. So as long as we understand the basis for your methodology, then we then can discuss whether it's appropriate or otherwise. So I think if we start on that basis and come talk to us in a pre-lodgement sense or a prevention sense, it's in we're both better place to avoid the unnecessary compliance costs later down the track where things have already happened and been lodged and you relied upon them. And obviously those particular um, amounts are then depreciated and then there's revenue side implications as well. Right. So does that help you in that respect? Sir? Yeah, no, it does, yeah. yeah. The only other comment I'd make, which is a minor one, um, you mentioned before that you know, during a PCR process you might ask to see these calculations. 
My only comment is during a PCR process, that's all, sometimes that's too early because you actually haven't done the calculation and that might be no, because no, there's that. some completion accounts that are, you know, that still need to be completed and, and so it mightn't be until after your end that you actually land on a position. Yep. So, With the actual PCR product, you're right, there are instances and I will mention that later in the presentation about certain other events as well where it may be inappropriate or at, um, not at the right time to ask certain questions. Now the PCR product is obviously under review um, but when I first implemented it many, many years ago, the whole point was there would be things that occurred during the, your trading year that we would like to be aware of. Mm. Now, obviously, the way in which your lodging return will be at the time of lodgement. But you will be aware of certain tax issues during that year. So we would like to have a discussion with you to have an understanding of how you're thinking these things may apply and also give us an opportunity to let you know whether we see the potential risks. So it's a conversation around early engagement. Now, what you're saying is exactly right. Now, there might be things post the event that we need to look at, so post lodgement, immediately thereafter. And there is a period in that, you know, whether it's a current product, I mean, just lost a bit of track, but when I was familiar with it, there was a post lodgement component in order to have the ability to do that, is what you're saying. There still is, yeah. largely. Yeah. So, um, there are, like I said, certain timing issues in terms of what information is available. Yeah. Um, like I mentioned later on, there's certain things around sensitivities, where around transactions that occur that you may not feel comfortable in talking to us at the time, but as long as it's in a pre-lodgement sense, we're all going to be better off because we can talk about what the concerns are and ways to mitigate those concerns, if any. Yeah. And provide you that certainty, I think that's what it is. That, that discussion provides that transparency on both sides around what the facts are and where each other sits then we can work out ways in which to mitigate those risk threats, you know, potential concerns, as they're usually phrased. And then after that, we can say, we can provide you a level of certainty, whether that be through a binding process in a private ruling, or we can have a sign off in terms of a risk-based approach, in terms of a compliance. And what that administrative exam, um, proxy, the um, LIBOR example I was talking about, is one such approach. So, Okay, just noting I'm limited for time and I've been told I have two minutes left and I've got more than two minutes left, I better keep going. Um, in this slide, it's not actually on the slide, but uh, lucky me, um, the exposure draft on the uh, budget integrity measures was actually uh, announced last Thursday, well, I think, or a bit Wednesday. earlier than that. Wednesday. Yeah, Thursday was my birthday, so I had my um, birthday to look through it. Um, yeah, lucky me, a bit like Steve. So. Um, now, Though there's obviously 48 were just thrown out uh, after a while and, and uh, hopefully that particular discretion the Commission has been given will allow us to deal with some of those others that haven't come through in this particular exposure draft. But I'll cover a couple of them. Um, one of them was, um, and like, I should note that as an ATO we don't actually comment on the policy of these points, just raising the fact that it's actually been announced and uh, it is for comment by Bin May and my colleagues will have some, uh, raise some concerns about some you know, the timing of, I suppose, the uh, effect of some of these announcements, if the, once, once or if they get given royal assent. Um, but I suppose the issue there is, before I go into some of the detail, is that some of these transactions, because of they were announced m many moons ago, um, will also have retrospective effect. So the issue there is, what's the compliance effect? You know, what's the commercial impact of some of those? Now, again, as an ATO, we don't comment on those, but we're happy to hear from you today and obviously I recommend you voice any concerns through your comments back to Treasury on those. But one of those is obviously the, um, the deductible liabilities measure. So where there's a, obviously a double benefit you know, or there could be a double detriment depending on the type of um, liability it is. So we're talking about long service leave, all those things where they're added into the step two but also deductible later on because they actually haven't been expensed yet. Um, now. Kate, did you want to ask a question or a comment? I know mean, we were talking this morning about the yeah. impact of those. Sorry to put you on the spot. That's all right. It's, uh, it wasn't really a question. It was more of a comment about the frustration as a tax manager that I have communicating to both the board and the shareholders around issues that were announced two years ago and still, a year, well, sorry, as of last Wednesday, we now have the legislation. And it's just, I know this was raised at the meeting that they had last night. I just find it appalling that this is, the, this is, this is what's happening. And there are obviously other, there, this is not the first time that this has happened. But mm. these announcements were made two years ago and we now have the legislation. Tax returns will have been lodged and I understand the ruling 
that gives you comfort around what you've done in your tax, well, hopefully will give you comfort the around what you've done in your practice statement, sorry. But um, it's just this is just a general comment from, from a frustrated tax manager. No, no, and, and we hear those as well. Uh, I suppose at the other, <laughs> other, the other end of the spectrum, there's a securitisation measure, which I think a lot of taxpayers in the financial services would be very happy to see be yes. retrospective, especially if you're the vendor of those securitised assets. So I suppose it's a give and take on those, but yep. again, I'm not here to comment on the policy behind that, but just to let you know that the reason I'm mentioning those is because they will have an impact on what you've already done. And you know, depending on how you've lodged your returns, you may need to go back and review them and amend them, depending on the, you know, I suppose the implementation date and the effective date of the legislation, if or when it's actually passed. So just be aware of that and your governance process plays an integral role in that, making sure that you can have the ability to review your returns, go back and look at the figures and see if you're actually impacted by it. Okay, so I won't mention any more about that. Um, deductions under consolidation regime. So again, we just mentioned a couple there, but I'll just go through saying that um, obviously after the tax cost of an asset uh, enters a group and is set, the next step is to determine how that cost is taken into account in working out taxable income. From an ATA perspective, we seek to ensure that future deductions are uh, not taken earlier than required under the law, a bit like the point I was raising earlier about depreciating assets and inflating the, the cost base of those assets. Um, then, and those positions are actually supported by evidence. Okay? So we've, we've highlighted this in particular because we've recently done some uh, compliance activity in that space and some of you may have received a letter from the ATO talking about these wonderful rules that have a pre-component, an interim component and a prospective component. Um, just to make it nice and simple for everyone. Um, so again, hard, not going through the technical parts of the, the actual provisions, but highlighting the fact that what you should be aware of is depending on your acquisition date and some, and some other general factors, different rules or different apply to different periods. So again, you may need to open up those returns, you know, and again, we may have passed that date, but just highlighting the fact and having a look at which potential rules apply. And depending on which rules apply, it has a very different outcome, you know, depending on the intangible asset, etc. Um, Mike, can I just point out, um, without saying too much, this time next month, um, our firm has a case in the federal court involving the interpretation of some key phrases in the tax consolidation provisions being the meaning of rights to future income and also the meaning of unbilled income assets and it raises valuation issues, so some of these contentious issues. This, yes. this, this is a sort of core part of the controversy around the consolidation provisions, yes. these provisions, made more complex by the fact that you have pre-rules for a certain period, interim rules and then final rules coming out. So That's right. a little bit of a dog's breakfast in terms of the legislative provisions, but um, absent the matter that I'm referring to settling in the next month, there will, down the track, it will be ventilated in court in early June and then at some stage we will have a judgment that follows that gives some clarity to these key terms. That's right. Um, so I suppose in that point too, in terms of the governance, tax governance perspective, um, just following up from what you're saying, Chris, some of the things that we would like to see made available to understand whether something is a right to future income or does fall into a particular category or under the particular rules that apply for that period, I suppose are contracts and associated documents outline the acquisition date and when the arrangement for the acquisition commenced. Contracts and associated analysis determine any rights to future income assets. So from that analysis of what you're talking about. Um, example, if the customer can unilaterally cancel the contract or agreement at any time without paying compensation. Again, what's, this is coming from the legislation itself. Um, evidence of the existence of a revenue asset. Again, so not just, no, we actually need to see evidence of that revenue asset. Analysis around why, uh, around the reason why your client has adopted a particular interpretive provision. Again, that's to establish, I suppose, a reasonable argument position. You know, if there's no statutory authority or level of authority, it goes back to that well-reasoned construction to provide us that wrap. And again, like you said, Chris, when looking at assets such as work in progress or unbuilt income assets, tax managers are urged to take care when looking at trial balances to ensure the accounting characterisation of items is consistent with the tax treatment. So often involving reviewing the underlying contracts. So again, particulars of the contracts is to make sure that we understand the evidence behind that. Now, we're saying there might be something developing in the federal court. This is probably a work in progress itself, using a pun in, pun in the words. Um, again, though, I can't stress more than anything. Because it is so complex, if you are uncertain, come see us before your lodge return. Now, I know we talked about you know, resourcing issues, potentially if everyone comes and sees us, but we're opening up the floor so we can actually prevent things from occurring. 
and where we can, like and depending on what's going to happen in the federal court, we will provide guidance. It's inevitable to provide guidance in some way because obviously we can't provide rulings to everyone. Uh, one way of doing it is providing guidance in maybe a public ruling format or it might be in some other format that provides some administrative guidance as well. I mean, the tax consolidation provisions have been around for some time now, if you go yep. back to 2002, but when they were brought in it was, let's face it, a brave new world for the Australian tax landscape and the government slipped up in certain areas and one of them that they slipped up in was they underestimated the potential through the ACA pushdown process for effectively what well, to date was capital acquisitions to generate revenue deduction spin-offs, hence the three versions of those rules that I just went through before. If that had happened in our current times of significant budget deficits, there would have been all hell to pay, but it happened in a time when of budget surpluses and a, and a booming economy, so it took a fair while to catch up and for these new rules to come in. In fact, seven years to catch up and for people, and that people being government um, and the commissioner, to recognise uh, the, the breadth and reach of these provisions. Um, it's now only coming through the, ju the judicial process that these these rules will be tested. Um, but what will hold good for the pre-rules may not necessarily hold good for the interim rules right. and so on, because the definitions are different. Yep. Chris, I think it's fair to say that if we knew what we if everyone knew what they knew now, we wouldn't have had the consolidation regime that we've got. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Again, we're not worse. able to comment on policy, but by all means make yeah. those comments. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've just, it's a comment been made to me by many times by <laughs> Yeah. Okay, um, just moving on. Um, specific issue relating to MEC groups. You've got Again, one minute, Michael. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but look how excited they are to keep listening to consolidation. Yeah. Yeah. It's more like Marsha, Marsha, Marsha now. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, with MEC groups, again, there's a number of points on that, on that screen, um, but I'll just mention a couple, capital gains tax and restructuring. So in many cases, MEC groups can undertake relatively simple restructuring but to avoid CGT on the sale of domestic assets that are currently within the Australian tax net because they are owned by an Australian resident taxpayer. MEC groups can achieve this by simply moving assets to a tier one company or new, newly formed tier one company, then selling the shares in the tier one company rather than selling the shares in the underlying asset. I'm not inferring anything, just hear me out. And now, as long as the Div 855 rules are not triggered, so the EG, the principal asset test and 855.30, the sale is effectively tax free, right? Now, in relation to the example we just discussed, if we saw something like this, Obviously, we're going to start asking some questions. Now, this flows neatly into one of the later slides, which I'm not going to mention for lack of being you know, crucified. But anyway, it, you need to explain to us why that occurred, why that restructuring <laughs> occurred. Now, you know, simple tax planning versus tax avoidance, that's the discussion we're having, obviously. So we need to understand the basis for the restructuring. And like I said, there are flow transactions in your business, and there, there's the non-flow. This would obviously be a non-flow transaction that would actually have a, a very a big interest in. Now, like we mentioned in the international space, there are laws that allow this to occur, but again, structuring your way into the provisions to allow something is something a bit above and beyond tax planning. To what extent? We're not going to comment on today, but you need to be aware of that in terms of your governance. Um, just raising the point, there's also a consultation paper that was released in March that addresses some of these issues, and I suppose the perceived advantages of a MEC group over a consolidated group, in terms of whether you bring something in as an ET1 or a subsidiary, whether you contain a reset cost basis, and there's planning there. So obviously there'll be some comment around that. Uh, in terms, given I'm short of time, reporting and lodging obligations. Again, we're talking about notification forms and reliance on those. You know, just because something happens for GST doesn't mean you take for granted that we understand that it's the same implications for consolidation, different grouping rules, different notification. So we still need to have that information in the discussion. If you're unsure, come talk to us. Um, in terms of losses, again, because of the available, available fraction and the way it's calculated, in terms of modified market value, again, modern market value comes up. If we do see you know, modern changes to market value of loss entity coming into a group, you know, even though there's rules in there about restricting injections of capital and things like that, we will be asking questions because it obviously uh, it in inflates the, the available fraction, therefore the losses that can be utilised within the consolidated group. So just be aware of that. And given I've got five seconds or less, um, Part 4A. Now again, as we said before, Part 4A is changing, the, the rules have changed. 
McCain. I suppose the basis for those rules in terms of what we still look for hasn't really changed. It's, so I suppose the commercial drivers behind the transaction. <coughs> so again, there's I suppose a continuum from tax planning to tax avoidance. And with, you know, there's a couple of points about inappropriately accessing the consolidated provision to facilitate the obtaining of a cost-based uplift um, to, under, to the underlying assets. <coughs> Particular recent case in Mongoose, um, my case. Um, you know, some may say the court got it wrong three times, but that's okay. Um, I can deal with it, I think. Um, but the, I suppose the issue there is looking at what actually occurred and looking whether there was a scheme that, you know, that satisfied the commercial land. Is there something simpler that can still give you that same commercial benefit? Now, if there's a number of steps inserted into a transaction that don't make commercial sense, we're going to be asking questions. And you should be aware that we'd be looking at Path for a in that sense as well. If there's something that belongs to tax planning, I know you're going to cut me off, but I've got to finish. I am. <laughs> yeah. um, as, just be aware that the commercial considerations and drivers need to be explainable behind transactions where there is a lot of complexity that isn't explained evidently or just it's not obvious to us. Especially if we've seen other transactions that are, let's call them counterfactuals, that you would have done or possibly have done. Now, given the changes in Part 4 a there is no more null hypothesis, so to speak. So we can, I suppose, produce a counterfactual that's reasonable in that sense. So I'm happy to take some questions. No, no you're not. You have to sit down. Sorry, Mark. We're, <laughs> we're at time. Um, thank you very much for that. Ladies thank and you. gentlemen, you'll see that um, in your programs, um, 15 minutes was allocated for me to do a wrap-up. I've skillfully managed that time down to make it a 60-second wrap-up, um, and we'll have you out of here in, in a few moments. So I want to thank the, um, all the panel members, um, and particularly ATO, for taking the lead. Um, on that, we've heard a lot of interesting messages today. We've heard a more transparent ATO, an ATO encouraging dialogue. We've heard cultural shifts. Uh, we've heard engagement. We've heard come and talk to us. Um, and if you don't know who to come and talk to, you know, there's way to, ways to make that happen. So a lot of, a lot of openness, a lot of transparency. Uh, all that bodes well. We've also heard of the focus areas, particularly in the area of international. Um, we've heard about GST compliance processes. We've heard about um, the, the core areas of consolidation focus, market valuations and particular provisions around step two and the like. So um, that is my, uh, Heather, you wanted me to do a wrap up. It's the 60 second wrap up. It's not a 15 minute wrap up, sorry. Uh, thanks again, guys. Thanks, Chris. Um, just on behalf of Walters Kluwer, I'd like to thank the ATO panel for taking the time uh, to join us here today and also our esteemed panel of uh, corporates. Uh, thank you very much uh, for attending today. Uh, just for the audience, um, you know, we've run these sessions for you guys. If you do have any feedback, uh, we do have survey forms within the packs. Um, and thank you, audience, for coming. You know, you, you, we, we do put these on for you. And if you guys continue to turn up, we'll continue to uh, run these events. So thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your day. Your day. Cheers.